and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, as usual at this point, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones and other wireless devices as they can interfere with the sound system um, and sometimes disturb the meeting. Uh, the caveat to that, of course, is that members and uh, officials are using tablet devices, and of course this is instead of the hard copy of the papers. Our first item on the agenda today is supporting the legislation, and we have one affirmative instrument before us today, uh, which is the Health and Care Associated Professionals Indemnity Arrangements Order 2014 draft. Um, as usual, um, uh, with uh, uh, affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence-taking session with the Cabinet Secretary and his officials on the instrument. Uh, once we have had all of our questions answered, we will have the formal debate on the motion. Uh, can I now welcome uh, Cabinet Secretary and his officials, Alec Neill, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing. Uh, pleased to have you here, Cabinet Secretary. Jason Birch, Senior Policy Manager, Regulatory Unit Health Directorate and uh, um, Alicia, um, uh, Elsia, is that? Elsa. Elsa, sorry, <laughs> having a great day here. Uh, Principal Legal Officer, Food, Health and uh, Community Care, Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make a few opening remarks? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Convener. Uh, present in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, there is no consistency across the nine statutory healthcare regulatory bodies in legislation or guidance on the need for health professionals to have insurance or indemnity in place. The Scottish Government and the health departments in the three other nations believe this is unacceptable for individuals not to have access to compensation where they suffer harm through negligence on the part of a healthcare professional. To rectify the situation, this order will require all statutorily regulated healthcare professionals who are practising to have insurance or indemnity in place as a condition of registration with their respective regulator. Unless regulated healthcare professionals can demonstrate that such arrangements are in place, they will be unable to practise. The development of this order follows an independent Four Nations review led by Finlay Scott, the former Chief Executive of the General Medical Council, which reported in June 2010. The key recommendation of the Finlay Scott review was that there should be statutory duty on registrants to have insurance or indemnity in respect of liabilities which may be incurred in carrying out work as a registered healthcare professional. The four health departments accepted the report and its main recommendations in December 2010 and undertook to introduce legislative changes at the next opportunity. The order also implements Article 42D of the 2011 European Union Directive on Patients' Rights in Cross-Border Healthcare. This requires member states to ensure that systems of professional liability insurance or a guarantee or similar agreement that is equivalent or essentially comparable as regards its purpose and which is appropriate to the nature and the extent of the risk, are in place for treatment provided on its territory. It is important to note that the vast majority of regulated healthcare professionals are in receipt of cover by virtue of their employer's vicarious liability or via a professional body which offers an indemnity arrangement as a benefit of membership. However, it should be noted that it will be for individual healthcare professionals to assure themselves that appropriate cover is in place for all the work they undertake. In conclusion, convener, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that people have access to appropriate redress in the unlikely event that they are negligently harmed during the course of their care. Everyone should have this right, and I'm happy, obviously, to answer any questions to the best of our ability. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for those opening remarks. And we have a question from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's my understanding that um, to ensure that everybody has indemnity insurance, that will be a condition of their registration to provide evidence of that indemnity insurance. Is that right? Yes. If somebody is taking a career break and not practising, that be could become a barrier to them re-registering, which means that once people are trained, um, if they're taking a career break, say, for instance, bringing up family or the like, um, that it's one cost keeping up your registration. It's another cost entirely keeping up an indemnity insurance that you're not using. Will there be special measures in place to cater for them? Okay, Elsa to handle the detail, but the, the principle here is that it is for practising healthcare professionals. So 
if you are practising, you require the indemnity insurance. My understanding is, and Ailes is, the lawyer will confirm us that if this is correct, but my understanding from the briefing is that, say, a woman who has taken, say, five or ten years out in order to have a family, during that period when she's not practising, would not be required to indemnify herself. Um, yes, Cabinet Secretary is correct that the, the terms of the um, order relate to registered professionals who are practising as such. So in cases where they're not practising, they wouldn't be required, my understanding is they wouldn't be required to keep up their insurance for that period. They would still be able to keep up their registration? Yes, I think there's a diff different categories um, um, at play there, yes. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, thank you, Kinsey. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. And can I say I welcome this, uh, this uh, order? But I noticed that the provision relates to regulation of the majority of healthcare professionals is reserved to the UK Parliament. What percentage of professionals would this order the, through the Scottish Government cover? It will pretty well cover all the 32 professions who operate in the National Health Service in Scotland, and they are covered by the nine regulatory bodies that I've referred to. Um, so uh, it would include nurses, midwives, doctors, uh, ophthalmic uh, uh, practitioners, dentists, the whole range. And I can't think of hand of any professional group working in the National Health Service that would not be covered, and it's not listed as part of the 32 professions covered by this order. That's correct. Um, just to clarify, there's seven um, professional groups that are devolved responsibility to the Scottish Parliament. Um, we can supply details of those if, if that would be helpful. If you don't mind, thank you. Richard Simpson. Yes, uh, just to pursue the um, licensing, if they're registered but not licensed, then they can't practice. As this is doctors, they, they won't be able to practice. So I presume your previous, Ms. Ms. Garland's previous remarks will cover that, that if they're registered and then decide to practice again, decide to license again, then they'll, they'll have to uh, pay the indemnity. Yes, I mean, the wording, um, as you're probably aware, the, or the order makes amendments to different pieces of legislation that are already in place. And so the actual wording for different professional bodies is slightly different. But, for example, in relation to a medical pr practitioners, um, it's in relation to those who hold to a licence to practice and who practice as such. Um, th that's, that's where the requirement to have indemnity um, applies. And if I could ask you just a further question. Uh, at the moment, if you're practicing within a hospital setting, the hospital covers your indemnity. Um, but if you're, if, you're, um, if you're, for example, a GP working on a locum basis where the health board is employing you, who covers your indemnity at that point? My understanding is that the G GPs are all covered by themselves because they are independent practitioners. They're not part of a National Health Service policy because they are independent. But they right. do have to cover themselves. But uh, the ones I'm talking about, I mean, I understand that for the independent contractors, but there's a group of professionals, dentists and uh, doctors, um, and there may be others, who are employed by the health board directly. They're not independent contractors in, in the general sense of the term. They are, they are directly employed. They are salaried doctors. Uh, will they actually be covered by the NHS or will they have to pay for this themselves? 4% of GPs in the National Health Service in Scotland are salaried GPs. They are employees of the National Health Service. And my understanding is that they would be covered by the National Health Service because we cover our employees. Certainly, that would be my understanding. If they're employed by the Health Board, then there would be an insurance arrangement through that. Um, I'm not absolutely certain. We could check... Um, the other thing is that there are... We'll double check on GPs. Uh, that's fine. You know. I mean, there are, there, are some, there are increasingly complex arrangements for employment. Uh, you know, some people will be employed uh, via the health board, but through an agency. And again, you know, is the, is the agency then responsible for, the, for ensuring that there is an indemnity? Or is it the practitioner themselves? Or will it be the health board who are actually purchasing services from the agency? My understanding is, and Ilza will correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that the very clear duty in law, uh, where you're not employed by the National Health Service, it is the duty of the doctor, the practitioner, to ensure that they're indemnified. Right. Okay. Is that right? 
Um, yes, yeah, certainly in terms, of, in terms of the order, in terms of the new arrangements, um, it'll be up to the practitioner themselves to, in, to ensure that they have indemnity in place and that'll be a condition of their uh, licence or registration, however it's termed, for that particular professional body. Where they're working for somebody else, I think my, my understanding is that normally there's insurance in place through their employer, um, but in each case it'll be for them to check in that particular circumstance because in any case where they're practising, um, they'll require to have insurance in place. And my last question, which is following the same trend, is that uh, after Reddy Grant's question about career gaps, of course, you, you can be in a career gap and still be being sued for a piece of negligence earlier on. So, um, you know, will, will, the, will the requirements for the particular form of indemnity require that practitioner to carry indemnity beyond the point because if you're no longer part of, say, the Medical Defence Union, then Medical and Dental Defence Union of Scotland, anyway, uh, will, you, you know, will you still be covered or not? Oh, my, my understanding, and again, Ailsa can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is in that situation, uh, what matters is the date when the alleged uh, harm took place and was the doctor indemnified at that stage. If the doctor is indemnified, and legal action goes on for two or three years thereafter, the indemn indemnification does cover the cost of that action right through to conclusion, is my understanding. Yeah, certainly that's how I imagine it would happen with any, as with any sort of insurance policy, that even if you're not insured at the time, if an, if an event had occurred when you were covered, um, then I assume it's similar to um, a, a car accident or something that had occurred and you maybe no longer have the car but the the liability for the insurer continues um that's yeah. certainly how i'd understand how it would operate yeah, that's, that's what I understand. and we have a number of staff also employed jointly by the nhs and by or they may be employed you know with health and social care integration coming along they'll be employed by the nhs and and but they may also be employed by the local authority or they may be employed by the new authority if it's a an employing authority, uh, will that all be covered? Will they all be covered by, if you know, the, as, as they are under the NHS at the moment? Well, initially, initially the integrated boards won't employ any directly any um, medical staff, but of course, through time, the legislation allows them to do that, uh, and very clearly, um, there would then need to be an arrangement between the health board and the integrated authority about who covers the indemnity, but. It, it still is the fact that under the legislation, the practitioner, the health professional, will still have to be indemnified. Thank you very much. Gil Patterson. Thank you very much. Those uh, practising uh, professionals who will now be responsible to identify, uh, 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 provide uh, uh, insurance for themselves, will health boards or the government have a uh, oversight uh, of uh, those people do they, would they need to register, in fact, that they have uh, uh, secured that uh, uh, um, insurance. No, it, if, if anybody is carrying out any work for the National Health Service, the National Health Service must obviously make sure that they are indemnified. If somebody is in private practice, uh, it is entirely their responsibility, and we have no regulatory authority over that at all. That answer my question, uh, Colin. Kia. My question was on the retrospective aspect that Richard Simpson brought up. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, Bob? Yeah, thank you. Just briefly, it's kind of similar to, to what Richard Simpson was saying, but from a, from a different angle. I, I see that you've, it's been consulted on with stakeholder groups, obviously would include the NHS and, and other, other health professional or, or organisations and practitioners. Uh, I suppose what I'm asking about is any insurance scheme is only, only as good as the policy that you take out. So does the Scottish Government have any control over the quality of the indemnity scheme that, 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 that's, that's taking out? Are there one or two large providers who specialise in this kind of thing that healthcare professionals would sign up to if practising privately? Or are they just within their rights to shop around and find, find the best deal, the same way some people, other people would do for 
other forms of insurance policy. So does the Scottish Government have any control over that? Well, the, the, the boards are responsible for ensuring that their employees are indemnified because the boards are an employer, not me as a minister. So it is entirely in law the responsibility of the board to ensure that people are indemnified. Now, obviously, the board is entitled to shop around and get the best deal. Uh, and different boards uh, use indemnification through different uh, organisations, different companies. But the regulation of the indemnifiers of the insurance is a reserved matter and is part of the financial services uh, regulatory regime rather than per se part of the healthcare regime. In other words, a, a health board will only indemnify or a commission uh, an insurance or indemnification policy from a licensed and hopefully respected and respectable insurance company. And actually, I have to say, Cabinet Secretary, that's what I thought would happen in relation to, to NHS boards. Um, I would hope and expect they, they'd be very robust in, in how they would take out the, the, these indemnity uh, policies uh, for all staff working in the NHS. There was more thinking about uh, the private sector, uh, so other areas of healthcare provision where it's possible for that they might shop about to reduce margins that, that they have and you, the, the, you wouldn't have any control as Cabinet Secretary in relation to say that does cut the mustard in terms to the policy you sign up because in theory you could have a, a, a you know a private healthcare professional with a policy which they must have by law but uh, and there's we hope this never happens of course but there's a significant issue with practice there's claims against it and the policy is not as robust as you would think it would be hopefully this would never never happen but i'm just trying to think about the scottish government wouldn't have any control over that it would be a financial services provision at a UK level that would look at that? Or? Well, well, also, I think it's fair to say that the regulatory bodies themselves uh, have a, a close eye on this as well to make sure that those who are operating in the private sector are adequately and properly indemnified. It's not the role of the Scottish Government because we don't control the private sector, but I'm absolutely sure the regulatory bodies uh, will monitor that to ensure that... Uh, clearly that um, the policies that are taken out are of an adequate amount to cover any possible claim. Given the final bit of assurance that, that, that I need there, I, the final question I think, Cunar, would be, I suppose it would be within the right of any like regulatory body to, uh, or, or registration scheme to deregister uh, a practitioner if they thought they didn't have appropriate appropriate indemnity. So, so that would be a check and balance within, within the system. Well, I, I would have thought two things. If, if there is a private practitioner who has not indemnified themselves, particularly if they've done it deliberately and not, you know, just because they forgot to renew their, their policy, but if there was evidence, for example, they'd done it deliberately, I would have thought that would fall foul of the regulatory bodies and indeed a, their um, a, ability to continue in the profession. It uh, might even be called into question. I mean, obviously, the most obvious example is the General Medical Council. If you are a private practitioner, let's say you're a private cosmetic a cosmetic surgeon, and of course we've had some very uh, high high level cases of where cosmetic surgery has gone wrong, seriously wrong. Um, if the cosmetic surgeon has not been indemnified, uh, and in law has to be indemnified, I would have thought that surgeon would certainly take the risk of being struck off. I would have thought. That's helpful. Um, no further questions. Richard Lyle. Yeah. Yes, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, one of the points that Richard Simpson was making earlier on about doctors, doctors employed, doctors uh, working independently, what about out of hours doctors who uh, basically work for the NHS for a fee and may only uh, work uh, a couple of days or even just come... Uh, for one, one night and then uh, are never seen again? Well, my understanding is that they will be indemnified either through their board or through NHS 24. Excellent, thank you. That concludes committee questions. Thank you. We, we, we now the, then move on to agenda item number two, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI in which we have just taken evidence. Um, can I remind the committee at this point, as you usually do, that um, members should not put any further questions to the Minister during this session. It is a formal debate, um, and officials may not speak in the debate. 
Can I invite the Minister to move motion S4M 10156? Formally moved, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? No. Um, Cabinet Secretary, don't expect there's a need to sum up that uh, debate. Um, it, it, it might be useful just to point yeah. out, if, assuming there are, this is an affirmative resolution and assuming there are no difficulties with it in the Chamber, that it's anticipated the Privy Council will formally endorse this, uh, the, this legislation, uh, subordinate legislation, at its meeting on the 16th of July, and the legislation will then become effective as of the 17th of July this year. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for putting that information on the record. Uh, the question is then that the Health and Care, uh, uh, health care and Associated Professionals Indemnity Arrangements Order 2014 draft be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and your colleagues with you this morning. Thank you. Uh, we suspend at this point and quickly uh, for the set up to, for our, our first panel. Thanks for that. Eventually got set up here. Um, and we now move to formula to our, uh, item number three, which is to take evidence on stage one of the Food Scotland Bill. Um, we have the, um, a roundtable session here this morning. And, um, and, and as usual, um, uh, I, will, I will give um, 
precincts two to, to the panel members. Um, this is an opportunity for committee members um, to, to, to listen to comments on that, so I will always prefer them in this situation, so I ask for patience from my colleagues. Um, I think uh, we've, we'll go directly to questions, if, if that's okay, and we, if the panel members could introduce themselves as they speak, and that may get us more time for the discussion. If, if, is that agreed by everybody? We're happy with that? Thank you. Rhoda Grant for our first question, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, some of the evidence we've received um, while we've been looking at uh, Food Standards Scotland is that uh, the new organisation should take a lead in looking at um, health prevention, such as nutrition and the like, uh, tackling obesity in Scotland. I suppose, do people think is, is that what the role of the new agency should be? Um, is there any other aspects they feel the new agency should take on? And would it be um, resourced to take on those new duties and would it require more resourcing to do so? Sorry, three Anyone questions. Anyone to take that one? Yes, please. You... Uh, so I'm uh, Peter Morgan. I'm director of the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen. Um, I, I think the... Uh, New Food Standards Agency or Food Standards Scotland um, could be a very good vehicle for taking on the role of leading in uh, nutritional issues uh, relating to diet and health. Uh, I think the Food Standards Agency, when it was set up across the UK, was developed with the intention of providing leadership in that area. And I think it gained a lot of public confidence uh, in doing so, that the, the, it was seen as a place where the public could go to get, to get sound advice around nutrition and health. Um, as it's now been split up, I think there is more confusion. So certainly within Scotland, I think that uh, it is a role which the Food Standards Scotland could play. Um, however, I think that for it to con continue in that function, it needs to get access to some of the, um, the knowledge that was present in the Food Standards Agency UK, which of course have been lost. The websites have been lost, for example, which provide information to, to the uh, consumers. Uh, that would have to be restored, and I guess that's a resourcing issue. So I, I, I imagine that to set it up properly, there would be a resourcing issue in terms of providing the, the uh, infrastructure to provide that information to the public. So I do think the Food Standards of Scotland could be a good vehicle for providing uh, diet and health information to the public. I think there is then the broader issue of whether, in fact, it should take on a role which it perhaps didn't have before, which was perhaps advice around uh, obesity. Uh, and this is a difficult one because obesity is one of those things which bridges, uh, is a complex issue and isn't solely diet related. But I think there is, uh, it would be helpful for the New Food Standards Scotland to take on a role in leadership around diet related issues t towards obesity, recognising, however, that obesity and some aspects of obesity will have to remain within the uh, health department where, of course, there are clinical relationships as well. So my view is that, yes, I think the Food Standards Scotland could take a lead role in relation to diet and nutrition. In terms of advice, I reserve my judgment about uh, coordinating research with and comment, comment on later. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, Marion Bain. I'm the Medical Director of NHS National Services Scotland. And probably most relevant to this debate, one of our areas um, is Health Protection Scotland. But actually, I just wanted to follow on from uh, Peter Morgan's point um, about uh, the possibility to have more of an impact on, on some of the health-related issues in Scotland, especially obesity. Um, I think it is important to recognise that, uh, that the NHS already has a major role in that, and in particular, one of our sister special boards, um, NHS Health Scotland. So I think it would be a question of uh, being clear about what the relative responsibilities were and how to build on the, on the, on the best uh, of, of all of the different organisations. Anyone else? Please. Raman Kumar, consultant, public health in Lanarkshire. Um, I think I would support both the comments made and would say that, yes, both said in a if the food standards Scotland would be in an independent body and would be a good position to lead on that role of uh, public health nutrition and should work in along with boards and um, local authorities in strengthening what's already taking place and uh, support the partnership. So just um, support that. Yes. 
Yes, I think the really important thing, if the Food Standards Scotland is going to have a role in any kind of uh, public advice, it must be seen as independent. I think that's an absolutely crucial issue, that it must keep its ind independence, particularly from uh, industry and uh, even from government, in a sense. It's going to have to be seen as an independent organisation. So, so however the bill works, the bill must work to maintain that, uh, that independence. I know the organisation itself clearly is funded from government and so on, but to have that independence so the public can trust it, and I think that's a crucial issue that has to be borne in mind in, in rolling forward the bill and making sure that um, you know, it has that very, very strong link with the public rather than official bodies and so on uh, in terms of public perception. Any of the other panel members? It, it didn't take us too long to get to the independence question, but that's what happens in the Scottish Parliament. But it was a theme um, uh, of last week's discussion in terms of funding the body and, and the nature of the funding and the evidence last week. Um, you know, does raise questions. So, um, you know, I think also the the, the makeup of the board uh, as well. Uh, would anybody like to comment on uh, any of that in terms of the makeup of the board, the funding mechanisms as they are? And I, I took from the evidence last week, it may be wrong, that, that there's some core funding, but particularly uh, in issues of research and things like that, they're, they're, they're going to be bidding for funds and uh, you know so uh, how do you create independence for, for the body when they're funded in such a way and, uh, um, uh, and how strong can the board be will it represent the consumers is it can I have any response on that y yes yes I, I think the make of the board is going to be crucially important the individuals on the board have to be seen in themselves as, as trustworthy individuals who are not going to be afraid to speak out on issues, even if perhaps they're going against government policy. Um, and, you know, I, I know that's sometimes very difficult when, when you know, you, you're in that kind of position, but I, I think that has to be seen by the public as the, the essential nature of the, of the body, that it, it has that degree of independence. Clearly, it is, is going to be looking for uh, research funding, and if I could put in a historical comment here, when the Food Standards Agency itself was set up, um, it lost research funding that was already in the system. There was a change to the system. Um, then I think the Food Standards Agency at UK um, uh, lost out on, on research funding, which was, which was a great pity. Um, and I, I would hope that whatever goes forward in, in terms of uh, the, the way the new body works, that it does have an adequate research budget. I know that's very difficult to define what it is, but it must have that as one of its high priorities uh, to commission research and also to keep links with other funding bodies so that it can influence them if necessary, perhaps indirectly, in terms of pushing uh, funding towards issues of, of great public health importance, which are capable of resolution in real time because th there are many issues out there, and I'm speaking as a microbiologist, for example, we have made progress with Campylobacter in terms of research in understanding it better. Unless we understand it even more, we won't make very much more progress in controlling what is the commonest cause of bacterial food poisoning um, in, in Scotland. Yes, please, Professor Morgan. I think the issue of independence is, is, is a number, raises a number of different issues. There's independence as a a body which is separate then from the original Food Standards Agency UK. Previously, of course, it was part of the overall system. By becoming independent, it essentially has to be able to stand on its own two feet. But I, I think it's important to recognise it needs to work in partnership with other bodies. And those links are the crucial things that need to be sorted out. So um, I, it can't work in, in isolation of the Food Standards Agency UK, and I don't think it can work independently totally of the Public Health England. However, it does need to have its own identity and its own understanding of how it's going to go forward. In terms of research, Hugh is right that uh, there was a great loss of research money uh, when the Food Standards Agency UK was disbanded. Uh, the, the money for nutrition research certainly disappeared. I think there's still elements of money for, for uh, food safety research. But I think the issue is where does the new money come from? And, and I think that we have to be clear. 
uh, about that. The, the way I understand this situation is that previously the Food Standards Nation UK had a pot of money for research, which was quite a sizable pot, and as I say, that disappeared. Equally, the Food Standards Agency Scotland had a small sum of money which was targeted towards research which was for Scottish-focused issues. Um, uh, I would see that needing to be maintained. However, the wider research funding uh, opportunity, which of course comes from other government sources like RESAS, the uh, Rural and Environmental uh, Science and, and Analytical Services Division, that is a different budget. And we need to be clear that is a different budget. And I don't think it would be a good idea to raid that budget to put it into the Food Standards Scotland because the function of that, the, the recess budget, is different than the, the Food Standards Scotland, uh, Food Standard, Standard Scotland uh, budget. So in other words, if there is research money required for Food Standards Scotland, then I think we need to consider where that money is going to come from. Uh, and I think there is a debate in my own mind uh, what sort of research Food Standards of Scotland should do. So, for example, I think that if, if you have a body giving advice and is a legislative body, I'm not so sure it's a great idea for it to be the one commissioning the research. I think it needs a budget to do short-term research to answer issue, its own issues or specific questions, but in terms of strategic research needs, I would keep that budget independent. Any panel members? I'm giving please to the panel members. Yes, Robin. Uh, Robin Beattie, Association of Public Analysts. Uh, one part would be to look at your budget. I mean, a third of the budget is looking at the uh, uh, operations. So that's a third of it. Is it serving industry or is it serving the public? Is it a consumer champion or not? So there may be conflicts in there in the structure. If it's looking at cutting plants and meat plants, is it helping industry or is it helping the, the consumer? Mm -hmm. No other panel members? Bob Doris? Um, Talk about the, the independence of Food Standards Scotland. I wonder about the, the powers it has as well. And uh, I was looking through the bill, and there's a kind of general powers provision there, which says Food Standards Scotland may do anything which it considers necessary to exp exp to, or expedient for the purposes of or in connection with its functions. Um, and they're laid out within the bill. One of the things I think came up from a uh, witness from which last week was that the FSA, my understanding was, and Food Standards Scotland won't be able to have statutory access to food testing regime results from uh, industry. Um, and there was a, a belief that that would be very helpful. So when industry um, does do testing, that's information that should routinely be passed over to whether it's the FSA at a UK level, which is now going, of course, the new Food Standards Scotland. I'm just wondering if an opportunity to put on the record whether they agreed with that in terms of, first of all, I suppose the general powers question given there about the balance of powers within the bill, and I've got other questions perhaps later if there's time in relation to that, but the specific thing we got last week was the, the power to compel industry, large supermarkets, uh, producers for their own food testing results to be put to Food Standards Scotland. Would that be a welcome move if possible? Any takers? A general comment that you know the more information the body has, the better it will be to, to discharge its function. I think there is a, obviously an issue about relationship with industry and and uh, and getting information in that way. Um, I think I sit on the fence on that one in in terms of having you know overall riding powers to to, to to get information of that kind. But in principle, yes, it would be useful to have that sort of information. Kumar, I think. Well, in terms of uh, preventing outbreaks and having information up front, I think that would be very useful. And I think also that would boost um, confidence among the public in terms of the monitoring that takes place and the information that is available in terms of auditing and improving driving standards. I think that would be uh, helpful. So. Yes. I mean, on, on, on testing, that a fair amount of testing is done I mean, on, on a fairly random sort of basis. And I, I think one has to look very carefully at whether you're doing the right kind of testing on the right kind of foods and so on, because um, most of the results are going to be negative. Uh, and uh, my, my personal experience has been that um, that kind of testing is of value, but it's of relative limited value in, in giving, you know, good public health protection. There are other issues which are probably more important in terms of, you know, how well businesses are run. Uh, and a lot of, of course, that falls down to uh, local authority 
uh, enforcement officers doing their inspections and so on. And there are, fa there are fairly fundamental philosophical issues about the role of testing. Testing is essential, it is necessary, but it has to be focused and done in, 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 almost in, in terms of looking at something where you think there might be a problem, focusing on that rather than doing, having a general testing program, which can be quite expensive but give you quite small returns. I think that's something where clearly professional judgment is crucially important in terms of who's doing the testing uh, on what and so on. Probably better, yeah. Uh, it's things about uh, allowing industry to do its own testing. You know, Cadbury's, you know, they got caught short because they were putting salmonella in chocolate. Uh, so if we rely on industry to, to uh, look after their own shop, we do risk having problems as well. Uh, similarly with the, the horse meat, um, you know, industry was looking after themselves, but only looking for what they wanted to look for and didn't find horse meat. So you have to have an independent body willing to take that challenge on and look for the horizon scan, you know, the unknown unknowns, as it were. If you lie on industry, they'll just give you what you want to hear. Any other panellists on, on that one? Bob? Oh, yep, sorry. Mr Hamilton. Billy Hamilton, Glasgow City Council, uh, business regulation manager, really environmental health. It's really just to pick up on the, the broader question about, um, about powers um, and to fly off a little bit of a tangent. I've got a kind of rather unpopular view in relation to the, the enforcement role in all of this, and I think that um, um, I would like to see a slightly more aggressive role taken, to be honest. Again, being an enforcement person, perhaps it's in my blood, but I think that there's, a, there's an aspect of uh, going back to the nutrition and obesity issue that I feel there's, there's a need for a perhaps a more interventionist approach. Um, we have quite a, a lot of initiatives which go on, which we engage with uh, fairly peripherally, um, which encourage um, and support in relation to healthy eating um, but I don't feel that uh, it's a great source of frustration to me that there is no uh, final step that can be taken to push the issue slightly more uh, and we have for instance a scheme in Scotland which promotes or, or advises the public in relation to uh, food safety compliance I just wonder whether there may be more Scotland there is a, a, a move in the bill to make that uh, a mandatory scheme I just wonder whether there's maybe more scope to, to broaden that into a, a, a broader compliance issue or a broader performance issue with businesses in terms of their uh, nutritional performance and the kinds of food that they sell and maybe working out some kind of profile for businesses. And just some of your evidence about, about um, food sales in and around schools and, and young people? It would do. I don't want to pre preempt any discussion on that, but I think that that's leads me on to that way of thinking, to be honest, and, and, and the frustration that I feel and my colleagues feel and that uh, it's, you know, the evidence is there, but there's really not very much we can do. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really helpful, Mr Hamilton, because I was going to come on to that. I think just very briefly in relation to the, the, the general powers provision and in terms of uh, testing with industry, uh, I would hope it could uh, be partnership as, rather than just confrontational, because as some witnesses have said, there's no point in testing things you know are safe. Um, but, but uh, you know, supermarkets and large producers that are ethical in their practices would be keen to work with FSS or FSA to identify the higher risk areas to put an inspection regime around that, and that would be a good thing to see. So it doesn't always have to be confrontational. Hopefully, there's a partnership way forward there. But in terms of enforcement powers, that that would have been another question which Mr. Hamilton helpfully uh, allowed me to, to come on to. So I, I thank him for that. One of the things looking at the policy memorandum that I brought up last week was where um, food is seized that is safe, but is, uh, the, 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 the vendors are guilty of food fraud, if you like. There's, there's no power, there's power to seize that, but not to destroy that. And it could, in theory, go back into the, the food chain. The bill does appear to put a stop to that. And just looking at some of the more general powers, convener, um, uh, the duty to compel the reporting of breaches uh, 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 um, uh, outlets and um, the, the, the duty to uh, put inspection outcome displays much more prominently at, at outlets. And I know Mr Hamlet was talking about maybe a cluster of more powers, so I think this would be a good opportunity for witnesses to put on, on record 
any additional powers that they would like to see within the bill. But also, if I could just give a caveat, con convener, I'd imagine some breaches are small businesses trying to do their best that are not complying, and I wouldn't want to see those driven out of business, but to be supported to, to perform better. But what, what powers? I know Mr Hamilton started to give some suggestions. What additional powers would people like to see within the bill, particularly in terms of enforcement? Can I ask Mr Hamilton, is that, is that the case? If you seize food for one reason or another that's been labelled incorrectly or whatever, whatever, do you give them it back? Well, generally speaking, we don't seize food on the basis that it's not what it says it is. I mean, our powers uh, really extend only to seizing food where it's deemed to be potentially unfit. Uh, so there's a really a, only a safety imperative for that. The, the bill is introducing a food standards uh, power which mirrors that exactly, which is very welcome. Um, and it would, I'm assuming that the, the powers would still be the same. We'd go to a sheriff and get uh, the authorisation to destroy the food. One of the, the original questions that, that Bob has raised, is there any response from panellists on that? The challenge to strengthen the bill? No guarantees, of course. Don't say it. Be yes, Mr Hamilton. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, being an enforcement person, it's only natural that I would say, yes, there should be more enforcement powers. Um, I certainly respect the view that, you know, there's always potential for um, uh, inappropriate use of powers. But I think that, uh, if anything, there's a suggestion that some of the powers aren't being used adequately. Um, so I certainly take that point on board, but I think there is certainly a case for uh, the mandation, for instance, of the footage information scheme, which is, um, as I mentioned, welcome. The information is already available to the public through the Freedom of Information Act anyway. Uh, and I think that um, a more meaningful scheme, in other words, one which is mandatory for business, would, would be helpful. I know there are certain doubts about uh, how helpful it would be, but in our opinion, it would be you know, a relatively inexpensive way of going ahead. Uh, and as I said, I would quite like to see the, the scope of that scheme being expanded. Um, on the issue of powers, I mean, there's a, an additional issue which is quite close to, to my profession's heart, and that is the, the subject of food premises licensing, which uh, powers ex already exist within the Food Safety Act, but it's... Uh, I'd be crucified if I didn't mention that, you know, on behalf of my, my colleagues. There is a, a still quite a strong appetite for that in Scotland, um, primarily to, to prevent the emergence of unsuitable uh, businesses, just as a matter of course. Yes, Hugh Pennington. Yes, I, I, could I agree absolutely with all that has just been said you know, about the mandatory display of, 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 of the scores on the doors, as it were, which uh, has gone forward in Wales, and that there were supposedly going to be some problems with that, but as far as I understand, they haven't amounted to very much. And um, so, I, so I, I would, I'd be very much in, in favour of you know, that power being exercised you know, at this stage rather than leaving it to ministers to come, to come forward with that at, at, at an appropriate time. Uh, because I, you know, I think that would, be in, that would be very much in, in, the, in the public interest. Richard Simpson. Can I just clarify that? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Bobby BT here. Sorry, Bobby. Yeah, just to put something in, because there's a, perhaps a move towards looking at industry testing. Uh, you, you could look at the 80-20 rule. You could have 80% of your problems come from 20% of your, of your estate. You've got uh, E. coli outbreaks in Fife. You know, it's related to be a, a small restaurant. You have outbreaks of E. coli in, uh, in Wishaw, small butchers. You've got Glasgow. So you've got lots and lots of problems coming out of small areas. So you would expect an industry to self-police. That might be okay for your your Tesco's, your Asda's and such like. But who's going to look after the small guys that are causing a lot of the problems? You know, and killing people. Richard yes, Simpson. I mean, just on that point, it's not my main question, uh, convener, but the, as I understand it from our discussions uh, in Aberdeen when the committee visited, um, the proposal is not to have a five-point scoring system as they have in Wales, because how do you judge what's a three, what's a four, and what do the public understand by that? rather to have th uh, three levels which are that a health improvement notice will be issued and, and whether that should dis be displayed and how quickly it should be displayed. How long should the individual have the opportunity to rectify the situation before they're required to display it? So I'd like a comment on that. And then the two other levels are, yes, you've passed the health inspection, so you are regarded as a hygienic premise 
And then the, we've got a thousand at the moment who have the gold standard, which is, you know, a sort of exceptional standard. And that seems to me quite a good system. But I just wonder if we could get a, a comment just to follow that point on the health improvement side. How quickly should it be published? Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. Um, the, the, the issue of the, the scheme is, in Scotland is quite, as, as you described very well, it, it, it's quite a simple scheme compared to that in England, and it's less problematic. Uh, in reality, in the food hygiene information scheme, there only are two uh, statuses. One is, um, uh, is improvement required, uh, which the very small minority of premises actually are deemed to be improvement required. Uh, the vast majority are, are pass. And in other words, they, they are considered to be a satisfactory standard. Um, to, to, my, I'm sure that my colleagues would love to make this much more complicated and, uh, and, and more difficult or more impenetrable for the, for the public, but in reality, it, it's very simple and straightforward. It is completely flawed in the sense that it's not mandatory, and that is, uh, I, I would be looking for the scheme to be carried forward as it is, not to contradict what I've already said, and, and I'd like to see the, the scope of it rather than enlarged. Um, so we are saying a business is cleaned and it's uh, well operated, but the fact that it's uh, serving deeply unhealthy food in the main, um, perhaps there's, there's an avenue for us in the area. Uh, um, I don't know if that answers your question entirely. Not quite, because it's how long should they have before they have to comply with the health improvement or display the notice, well, I mean, which will have an effect on their business. A, I mean, I think, I think the, the key thing is to, to be aware of the fact that the display of the, the information is for public information. It's not an enforcement uh, tool. We have enforcement uh, mechanisms which would require the business to to, apply, to comply within a given period of time. If it was uh, if it was presenting an at risk, it would be closed immediately, probably. Uh, however, if it was, uh, there were something matters that were of a serious nature, they'd probably, probably be subject to a notice which would allow 14 days to rectify these issues. Um, the the scheme itself to display would be, I would imagine, be pretty much instantaneous. There would be a requirement to display straight away. Uh, if the business can sort things out straight away, then obviously they'd be allowed to change their display. No one else, Richard, I think. My question is really about research, and I understand from the discussions this morning and other discussions about the UK Food Standards Agency funding and being split and being underfunded. And we also heard from in Aberdeen that the research, there are, uh, there are a number of Scottish units involved in the research, with the route being the main one. Um, and, but the, the Scottish research is complemented by big units at Norwich and Cambridge, as I understand it. And moreover, research uh, funding comes from councils like the BBRC and from Wellcome and from other groups. Now, the Scudamore report said that the FSA Scotland and the Scottish Government must urgently identify the scientific capacity and capability it would require to deliver official controls in future so the decisions could be made about what, uh, what needed to be available in Scotland, what needed to be available elsewhere, and this should then be used to inform more strategic investment decisions. That was recommendation 33. And we heard from Jim Wildgoose at the evidence session last week that there are 15 scientific, UK scientific advisory committees. So could the witnesses give me an outline of you know, where actually we are and where we're going to go with a new research body. Uh, we've already heard about the rural fund and that should be separate, but um, you know, how are we going to have scientific advisory committees and systems because of the, the splits that have occurred in England? Um, and in addition to that, um, um, what, what's, what would happen if we were independent, an independent country? What would actually then happen in terms of, a, of all these aspects of research and relationship to the current complementary system. And, and the final bit, uh, convener, is that Dr. Wildgoose made it very clear that the Food Standards Advisory Committee would also cease to exist. And I wonder what the implications of that are for, for Scotland. That's irrespective of the question about post-September. OK, well, I think the first thing to, to tackle is, is the issue of advisory committees. Um, the, if the Food Standards Agency in Scotland becomes a separate body, then it's, it effectively has dislocated itself from uh, what went before. But, if, but, if, but in many, I guess in many ways, that's happened as a result of the Food Standards Agency being uh, fragmented in, the, in, in England, so to speak. So there are advisory committees which are set up for various different uh, activities, 
advisory committees on nutrition, uh, novel foods and pathogens, toxicology and various others. I do not see any advantage in duplicating those committees. They are already existing on the basis of bringing in the best people across the whole UK to give advice. To set up, set up a, a separate set of bodies would just be duplication to no uh, positive benefit. And you'd probably be using the same people who were already on the existing committees. So I think the best thing we should try, try and do is to harness the information and advisory, use the advisory committees that already exist. The, the issue is then how do we do that? Because previously, under the Food Standards Agency uh, and the old Food Standards Agency, the Food Standards Agency Scotland was part of the parent body. Therefore, you had all of the relationships uh, built in. Now that it's become fragmented, I think we need to revisit the mechanisms through which a new independent body would be able to influence and get advice out of those committees. I don't think it's impossible, but it would require us to go and look at how the mechanisms to make sure they were fit for purpose. Um, I, I can't imagine any reason why they shouldn't, that shouldn't be possible, because I think it's certainly from the advisory committees I know of, they would be they don't see themselves working solely for one body, they're just giving advice uh, and there's no reason why that advice should not be given to Scotland as opposed to, as, as, as well as England. I think it's the mechanisms that are important. So in other words, if advice around nutrition is currently being, uh, the secretariat for that is in Public Health England, then a conversation would need to go between Food Standards Scotland and Public Health England about how Food Standards Scotland gets proper representation and advice. So I think that's the, the first point. I would not duplicate the committees. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, all advice is about synthesizing information from the maximum number of sources. And any one committee, if it's the right committee, should come to the, uh, a, a good consensus on behalf of everybody. In terms of research, um, I think that uh, there are many, many places funding research uh, in, in these different topics, whether it's nutrition or food safety, and these committees, advisory committees, will filter that research. Whether we need to do more research independently in a food standards uh, Scotland, I am not so convinced. I think there are plenty, there's plenty of research going on, and the only question in my mind is whether Food Standards Agency or Food Standards Scotland need to do specific things to answer specific policy needs. I think there's sufficient research going on in other areas that would allow the committees, the advisory committees, to pull together the information they need. Um, so, and, and equally, I, as I said before, I'm not convinced that the, the, the body which is the advisory committee and also the enforcing body should be the same body that commissions research. I think there's a conflict there, which I think is best kept separate. Um, so I don't think there's, a, there's an issue about how well that the, the new body can get advice. I think that the mechanisms are potentially there. Certainly the advisory bodies are there. The mechanisms need to be examined to make sure they do what we want them to do. And I think in terms of research, there's plenty of research going on, no doubt. I mean, many of my colleagues would argue, well, we lost Food Standards Agency Scotland, as uh, Food Standards Agency in the UK, their research budget that has never been replaced. But nevertheless, there's a lot of work going on within the UK, across Europe, and the advisory bodies pull that information together for the benefit of advice through the Food Standards of Scotland uh, as, a, as an independent body. Could I echo what uh, Peter just said about, about advisory committees and uh, talk perhaps about the one that uh, of particular interest to me, the Advisory Committee Microbial Safety Food, which existed before the Food Standards Agency itself was set up. And um, it, 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 it's worked, I think, extremely well in producing uh, essentially a consensus view about, about what a problem is and what the best solutions are. Uh, and, and these can get embedded in legislation. Um, at, at the moment, its, it, it, it's, it's chair is somebody who used to work in Scotland, who's, who's now a professor at Liverpool. So you know, she knows the situation very well. And I think what Peter says about maintaining, in a sense, a formal link between that sort of committee uh, and what happens in Scotland is really important because so that they, they, they don't ignore any special Scottish uh, problems. There are one or two. Uh, I'll come on to one in a moment. But it, it is really important, I think, that that, that kind of link is maintained so that um, th th there, there is a Scottish voice heard on that committee or a Scottish representative, somebody who knows what the Scottish scene is on that committee, if at all possible. 
And uh, I don't see any reason, like Peter, why, why that couldn't be done. It, you know, the negotiations might be quite complex and difficult, as I understand conflict and, and negotiations always are between different government departments, because they're always looking after their own patch. But I think if that's done sensibly and, 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 and you know, with, with, the, with the right kind of uh, aim in view, which is clearly to protect public health, I don't see any problem about that. Um, as far as the research is concerned, again, I think... Um, Maybe I'm slightly different, Peter, here, but I think it would be really, really important for, um, for the, the, the Scottish Food Body to have a research budget of its own. It may well have, for example, to respond to a particular situation in Scotland, which may not be uh, caused, for example, from a microbial point of view by an organism that only exists in Scotland, but we may have a particular, a particular need in Scotland to look at a particular problem. And I think if we don't have our own research budget, it might be quite difficult to take that forward Timiously. Sometimes these things have to be done really quite quickly to get to grips with the problem, to find out what that problem was. Although the solution, um, for example, when we had the Wishaw outbreak in, in 1996, um, the, you know, work was commissioned on, on the back of that and had been commissioned before in similar outbreaks, which, uh, although they were looking at particular Scottish issues and required Scottish input to do the research, the, the, the results of that research applied internationally. They didn't just apply in the UK, they were of international importance. But I, I, I think it really would be important for the, the body to have a research budget on which it could call to do that kind of research and to commission its own research in terms of informing its own, its own policy. Um, if I could come back to the Scottish Food Advisory Committee, I was a foundation member of that, of that committee and one of the advantages of that committee was that it sort of um, held head office to account uh, in a way because you know, we, we, we saw ourselves as independent members of that committee. We were part of the Food Standards Agency, um, but we could ask questions that perhaps the office, the head office in, in Aberdeen didn't, you know, well, I mean, I'll say no more. But I, I think we could raise issues uh, and, and, and stimulate policy development. Um, and one of the great advantages of the Scottish Food Advisory Committee was that we met in public and we met in all parts of Scotland. We, you know, we went for, you know, from, from Shetland to Dumfries and I think that was a very useful way of communicating uh, with the public. It might have been quite expensive, but I think committee members felt that was a really important way of talking to people in public about issues, hearing what their views were. Uh, and, and being held to account as well because there were question and answer sessions. Um, if that body is not to be replicated, I think it's really important that the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the board of, uh, of, of the new body does the same thing, that it has frequent uh, um, interactions with the public, as well, of course, as having the appropriate interactions with, uh, with people in the Scottish Government. Yes, yes, certainly. I just want to make a point of clarification. Um, I agree with Hugh that the, but the Food Standards Scotland would have to have some budget for research to respond to, to timeless and, uh, and important projects for policy. What I don't, I'm really arguing is I don't think the body should be involved in coordinating or taking a lead role in directing research in the, in the general area. So was it, was it Dr. Uh, Wild Goose last week raised the issue about being very careful about this and, and um, have you, are you aware or, or have you been involved in any work that will ensure we continue to link into these scientific committees at UK level? Or, you know, what, what, what has been done to ensure that, that your concern is met? Well, at the moment, the committees I'm aware of, and I know people who sit on those committees, they, there is still an opportunity for uh, members of Food Standards Agency Scotland to sit as observers on those committees. But the thing is, I think that what, if we want to use those committees for what they can actively do, which is to uh, respond to questions which uh, Scotland may wish to have answered, or to get advice out the committees, then I think the, the linkages need to be re-examined because they were set up under the old Food Standards Agency UK and really haven't been re-examined in the context of the new world. So I think they, we, if we want to make sure we have formal arrangements where we can utilise the committees, firstly to, to perhaps examine issues which are important to the Scottish Food Standards Scotland, uh, as well as to get outputs from those committees, then we need to examine those linkages. 
you know, gives an opportunity to set up a separate Scottish committee. So is that contradictory to all of that? What would, the, what would that committee do? I don't think, I, mean, I think we, if we're talking about advisory committees for around specific issues relating to scientific research, then I see no point in duplicating those committees because we're using the experts across the UK already. If we're talking about a, a, a committee which may be a, a committee which was functioned a bit like SFAC, then that's a slightly different issue uh, where they're, they're taking an overall view within Scotland. And that perhaps isn't, you know, that's still possible, but it's not the same as the advisory committees relating to research. Yes, please. Yes, could I come in and agree with that? Absolutely. I think the, the, the scientific advisory committees are, are the crucial ones that we want to have those formal links into. The, the SVAC is a slightly different issue because that really wasn't engaged in research. That was engaged in, you know, it was in public communication, looking at issues in a, in a broad sort of way, slightly outside the box. But all the people on that committee were selected because they, they, didn't, they brought different uh, strengths to, to that committee right across the piece in terms of, of food. Uh, and I, I think... That's the sort of body I, I would like to see exist in one way or another, uh, just to get those people round the table meeting at frequent intervals to, to advise the body, to, to advise the board who will be busy with other things, running the organisation and so on, to, to make sure that nothing is being missed and that concerns uh, that, that are being uh, you know, properly addressed. But that wouldn't be a scientific advisory committee like the Advisory Committee on Microbial Safety Food, which has quite a different role, which does very, very... Uh, in extensive in-depth studies about a particular problem and it may well uh, one, one I think important reason which hasn't been mentioned as to why it's really important for the Scottish body to have input into that um, would be that that committee looks in depth at particular issues and there may be an issue which might be seen as more important in Scotland than in the rest of uh, the rest of the UK for example it would be very useful for Scotland to have that voice to persuade the um, the larger body to, to conduct a, 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 an in-depth study uh, using resources which might be beyond um, you know, um, the, the Scottish body to have to uh, employ to do that kind of study. Bob, you on this theme, and then I'll let you back in, Richard, then, because I'm aware of it. And, as yet. Only very na narrow in, in, in that case, then. In terms of, of committees, I, I note within the bill it gives a it gives a permissive power to form committees, not a prescriptive power. In other words, my reading of the bill is the expectation would be where the FSS feels the need to form a committee, it is free to do so, rather than prescriptively saying here are set committees and seems to be working on the basis that knowledge transfer across the UK, across Europe or across the globe is you find your expertise at the most appropriate level. So uh, it's just to make sure that, because we're talking about various committees at a UK and Scottish level, or wh whether the witnesses are content for it to be a permissive power within the bill rather than a prescriptive power, such as the nuts and bolts of the bill, really, convener, because we're talking specifically about committees. If, if there's nodding heads, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yes. With Dr. Bravin Kumar's paper and Health Protection Scotland, they talked about research, and particularly in cases of the Health Protection Scotland, they talked about seeing further opportunities. And I wonder, they didn't actually specify in the paper what, what those opportunities might be, because that, I find that really quite interesting. So have you had further thoughts about what these opportunities would be? I think from Health Protection Scotland's point of view, just a recognition that there are a number of areas which uh, relate to the, the food side of things, which it would be important to be able to do further research on. I don't think that cuts across anything that's been said earlier. A lot of these things need to be done nationally and internationally. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a specific expert in the area, but the, the sorts of things that my colleagues were talking about were uh, things like bacterial counts in food and stuff like that. I'm sure others on the panel would be able to reflect that more, more accurately. But it was more the point that we didn't want to lose that. There are still a lot of areas which need significant research in order to uh, protect the public's health better, and we, we would want to make sure that the, that wasn't endangered in any way. Yes, please. in terms of unique uh, challenges for Scotland, so identifying those, I mean, um, Professor Pennington referred to the sort of food safety issues in terms of particular things that might emerge within uh, Scotland, but also in terms of obesity or food poverty or other things that might come up. And uh, so those are 
some of the things we were referring to when we looked at further opportunities for research. Okay, I think you're going away. Yep, um, uh, Dr Simpson raised the point about Scudamore uh, Recommendation 33, which was talking about official controls. Uh, I saw that as a red flag to the government and the FSA to deliver official control laboratories because the network in Scotland is creaking and they're looking to you know, join uh, joint scientific services of the four official control labs. Uh, so that was a point and that's still to be addressed. And then that feeds into how we have national reference laboratories. If Scotland has its own FSA, is it going to have its own national reference laboratories or are we going to use the ones in England? That's still to be understood. And then that would obviously feed up to the European reference uh, laboratory. So I find it convenient hard to reconcile the, the two views that, you know, which in, in the public analyst paper, the budget has more than, more than halved in the last 10 or 12 years uh, for, for the public analysts. Um, and, and you were recommending a, a centralised national public analyst system as opposed to local authority controlling it. The local authorities were saying they wanted to keep the individual bodies uh, so that, I found that, that quite difficult. And then Professor Pennington making the point about, you know, testing is going to produce a lot of negative results and you need to focus it. So I'm, I'm trying to get my head around how, you know, how much we should be doing on that and whether we should have a national system or, and, and your point about whether we can, should rely on the UK national reference laboratories or do we need our own for everything? Local testing is useful, but a national scale allows you to buy larger pieces of equipment to uh, look at um, uh, the DNA sequencing and all the new techniques that are coming through, isotopes, looking at uh, authenticity and provenance, but that's not anything that we can fund in a local authority level. Uh, certainly sampling is, is half, as you mentioned, and that is uh, exposing difficulties uh, for the laboratories. Their, their uh, funding is, is drying up. Uh, what they're needing to do now is actually diversify and they're trying to scrap around and get some money. Um, what you don't want is an emergency and then there's nobody there to respond to that emergency. There has to be a continual supply to keep the capacity up, keep the expertise up, and then as soon as there's an emergency they can respond. That's one rationale for having a, a, you know, a national service keep it ticking over. Um, the Food Standards Agency are trying to prompt prime uh, and put some monies in from coordinated food sampling. Uh, but if you look at food, we're talking about food, but the agencies are looking, looking at feed. Uh, my local authorities, none of them would actually submit any samples and they wouldn't even take the free money from the agency to submit samples because the Trade and Standard Service don't have the capacity to deliver the samples. So there's that input on one side and then you've got the number of local authority officers on the ground to take samples reducing as well. So that's now being uh, diluted. So there's a lot of competing pressures there. And to compete with the multinational companies, you know, I mentioned that you're the big, huge ones, you know, Nestle, Cadbury's, all these big guys, uh, a small local authority lab is going to be uh, David and Goliath to try and make sure you can keep on top of that. Any other comments on the back of that? Yes, please. The point of view again would support that it should be a proportionate risk-based approach and in terms of availability of testing, especially when you're dealing with outbreaks when there needs to be a rapid response and in order to prevent uh, impact or negative impact, I think the access to uh, specialist testing is absolutely crucial in order to make sure that we can take that risk-based approach, approach in a very rapid way as it's expected. So I would support Yes, please, you Pennington. Yes, could I, could I, from the microbi microbiological point of view, I think we already have uh, reference labs in Scotland, have had for a long time, for, for organisms like E. coli 157, which, which do work well. Uh, and they're out with the, the, the Food Standards Agency. Um, uh, I think it is important that the, the, the new body keeps a very sharp eye on the funding of those laboratories because um, you know, they, they do provide a, a, a national service. And I, I've always had a slight bee in my bonnet about them not just providing a, a, a reference service in terms of um, looking at organisms that have been isolated in hospital laboratories and so on and um, typing them, but also they have a research function of their own. I think it's, it's quite wrong for a reference laboratory not to have some 
re re research function as well. And the point is being well made about the, the increased cost for providing those services uh, by um, DNA sequencing and so on. Although the cost of that is coming down, uh, it hasn't come down to the level where you can ignore it as, as, as a substantial cost. And that, that, I think, I would expect that the, the new body uh, early in its, in its um, uh, as soon as it starts, would be looking at that to make sure that there is an appropriate service uh, being provided across uh, Scotland. And if they don't think so, they should say so to the to the you know to the appropriate uh, appropriate bodies. Aileen McLeod. research funding, um, which of course we know is based on excellence and certainly Scottish research is well renowned for its excellence and will continue, in Scotland will continue to attract uh, research funding and participate in international research collaborations regardless of what happens uh, post the referendum on independence in September. But I wanted to ask, I just wondered what um, opportunities that panel members um, see for the new body to be able to lever in other sources of research funding, um, such as the EU's new Horizon 2020 programme, which I know one of the grand societal challenges uh, which the Horizon 2020 is seeking to address is around how do we tackle um, sustainable, how do we ensure there is sustainable um, food and feed uh, security and safety. And, and also to ask whether you see the Food, the food Standards Scotland um, having a crucial role to play in identifying areas for future research around, obviously, we've talked about diet, nutrition and obesity, uh, working in partnership with our key partners, whether it's on academia, uh, on the industry side and with other research institutes. But, you know, the, the key issue is around the uh, other sources of EU funding that we could obviously could use to lever in. Well, uh, obviously, I, I agree with you entirely. I think Scotland is... Uh, one of the best places to do research in the world and, and, and always punches above its weight and, and I think exploits um, funding from the European Union very well and, and I can see great opportunities for it coming through in the Horizon 2020 funding. Um, uh, I, I see that the, the leader for that research is going to primarily come from the academics but I certainly see that whilst I would not argue that the new body should be coordinating research, I think it should have a definite role in trying to influence what research it would like to see done. And that's, the, that's where I think that we would need to have some forum in which the Food uh, Standards Scotland could have an influence uh, on saying what sort of research it'd like to see being taken up. And that will influence the academics in terms of what funding they may seek uh, within uh, Europe or anywhere else. And of course, if you've got support from industry or from government for research, then that obviously makes the research uh, applications even more compelling. So uh, I see that that's the way it will work. If, if the Food Standards Scotland can bring forward its ideas and bring those through uh, some forum where they can have an influence on research direction, uh, whether that's in Scotland or beyond, I think that will be very good. And, and certainly it will be very helpful for the academics in terms of focusing them into what they see as the key priorities. Anyone else? No? Nanette Millen. The, the, the functions of the board. Uh, we've had comments, in, in particularly from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, about the actual size of the board, that the suggested minimum of three is, is not enough. Uh, and I just wondered around the table what views are about the size of the, the board for FSS and who should be on it, basically. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, well, clearly, um, you know, I chaired the, the, the committee of the Royal Society that, that, that came up with our, our recommendations. And, you know, we felt quite strongly that... that, that, that the minimum size was a bit on the small side for, 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 for the board, uh, not to have it too large. But, but clearly, it's not necessarily going to be representative, but it will have a sort of, uh, there will be a sort of fundamental representative nature to it of people from coming from completely different areas of expertise and background knowledge and, uh, and representing uh, consumer interests and so on. And we thought that three was really going to be a little bit on the, on the small side to, to, to get those interests, as it were, um, uh, re represented on the board in terms of what, what the board members could contribute to, to the way the organisation runs. 
So it, 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 was, it was really to have that, that, that breadth, because clearly what we're talking about is, is a, an incredible array of, int of, of, of problems. We, you know, we've got, some of them are much more simple to, to resolve. But I would say some of the microbiological ones we've done quite well, like some of our enteritidis, where you know, we have a vaccination program on the chickens, which works quite well. But if you talk about some of the other bugs that I'm interested in, uh, we're no better off than we were 10 years ago in terms of the level of human infection. And some of those infections are very, 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 uh, very serious. And yet, of course, we have these incredible problems with nutrition as well, uh, with, with poor diets, uh, inadequate diets, as well as um, superabundance of, of food. So the, these are, are problems which do have some connections, but many of them don't have much of a straightforward connection in terms of the answers to the problems. So that is why I think we said, felt philosophically that a larger board would be much, much wiser to have than a smaller one. Well, yes, representing those particular areas of, 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 of expertise, uh, clearly plus the uh, personal qualities of the individuals, they will have had to already shown that they're um, they're able to, to, to fight for their corner, let's put it like that crudely, in terms of um, the, the influence on, 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 on nutritional policy. The, the, and, and looking at um, one, one of the issues that, that was certainly important when I was on uh, the Scottish Food Advisory Committee was looking at how do, you, how do you persuade the public that what everybody knows is a good thing, um, but the, the public even knows it, but they're, they're not doing anything about it. And that, that actually is a common interest. That's in terms of obesity, that's there. Everybody knows that you know, being overweight is not good for your health. And, and also everybody knows that washing your hands is a good thing. How do you persuade people not to eat too much and wash their hands at the same time? And that can be very difficult. So, again, you need somebody on the committee or, or a, members on the committee who have some wisdom about how you communicate these to the, to things to the public in an effective way uh, that, that delivers. Otherwise, the body will just be a talking shop. There, there should be any industry representation? Um, I don't think industry is all bad, but I think this is the issue about the, the, uh, the credibility of, of, the, of, the, of the body itself. And if it's seen to be too close to industry, even if it um, is getting close for the, for the best, best reasons, and I, I think one must remember that uh, many parts of industry do not want to have food problems associated with their products. Uh, if, if you talk to any, and I've talked to, to heads of a big, a big supermarket, well, heads of big supermarkets have talked to me about a problem which has existed just before a board meeting uh, that's being held in public about an outbreak they've had, and they're desperate because they do not want their brand to be destroyed or damaged by that kind of thing. So they have a vested interest, not necessarily in protecting the public health, but in protecting their own business. But I, I think to have industry members, members who are clearly associated with industry, I, I, I don't think that would be a particularly good idea. And that's not to say that we might not have people on the board and, and senior officers who had substantial industry experience, but not current. Yeah, but what Hugh Pennington has just said there, does that not go counter to having industry looking after its own testing if they're desperate to try and hide what they may have? and covered themselves to protect their brand. Yeah, I, I'm slightly more um, Catholic in my views. I think the, the um, I certainly agree with you about the, the size of the board. It has to be greater than three, um, because I think we need to have appropriate representation of the key elements of what goes on in the, in, in the new body, but it mustn't be too large that it can't take decisions. But in terms of representation, I mean, I certainly feel very strongly that, that Whilst the food industry gets lambasted for a lot of problems around uh, health, they're also, in my view, the vehicle to getting better public health. And I think it's important we engage them to achieve that. Um, I don't think a single member from the industry is going to be able to subvert the whole board. So I, I, in my view, I think that we should be engaging industry uh, and having a member on the, on the committee because, or on the board because... I think they will, uh, it will be a positive uh, statement to the industry that, of, of what, that they can have a, an influence, but not necessarily a, a sole say. Yes, please, Professor Bain. With what's being said, and it makes, uh, certainly makes sense, I, I, I agree. Three, I think, would be too, 
uh, small a number. We don't want it to be too, too big because then it becomes uh, uh, unmanageable. Uh, and certainly that would be from personal experience and being on, on boards as well. Um, I, I just I thought about going back to our earlier discussions about the opportunities for the broader public health, so going beyond the health protection issues into the nutrition and obesity agenda for Scotland, and um, I suppose linking into health inequalities uh, and the potential to make a big difference there through through some of the work that that, that might be focused on. That would certainly lead us to to suggest that you should have someone on that board with a strong public health. Uh, um, background and with that uh, who can bring that to the to the agenda in terms of not just being able to see the obvious opportunities but some of the less obvious ones uh, to improve Scotland's health and to reduce inequalities. Hugh Pennington, thank you. Yes, I think uh, we don't talk about it very much because it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, fill us with any great pride, but the Glasgow effect, um, you know, somebody with some experience of, of that kind of very complicated issue, I think, would be something, you know, that I, I would like to see somebody on, on the board with, with that, particular, um, that particular expertise, and that really is a sort of public health person who, who sees across the piece and sees how difficult these issues are and clearly relates to other health issues as well. I think we've heard already that the, the new body should have a very... Um, strong relationship with, it, with, 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 uh, with health because, because clearly many of these issues overlap into health, things like uh, alcohol policy. I think the Royal Society did mention that we should look at whether the, the, the new body should, should have input there. It was, it's bound to have an input in terms of fraud because of um, you know, the, the fraudulent sell, sell of things like vodka and so on. So uh, I, I would agree that the, the, the public health interest is, is absolutely crucial and, and focusing on that particular Scottish problem, which is, which is what I, I call the Glasgow. I know it's unfair to Glasgow. I did live in Glasgow for 10 years, but I know what the problem is, and it's still there, and it's still writ large. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I uh, turn to Wally, Wally Hamilton and uh, Professor Hugh Pennington actually covered in, in part some of this, but uh, food fraud and what would be, if there were food fraud... Uh, what would be the sanctions? Would you like to see uh, more sanctions in regards to food law offences, uh, Mr Hamilton? Um, yes. Uh, I don't want to paint myself as a rather draconian enforcer here again, but I've, I've been pressing a number of years for a, a slightly more um, user-friendly regime, uh, including uh, fixed penalties, basically. I mean, it's a... It's a quick and easy uh, method of, of, of approaching enforcement. When you mentioned food fraud, I mean the the only recourse we really have in terms, of even even relatively low grade, and a lot of it is very low grade. Um, it, it's prosecution, uh, and we have big big problems with prosecution simply because the, the court system really just doesn't support it, uh, and we suffer probably more than most in terms of you know the, we don't have the critical mass that. You know, enables the, the court system to really to work in our favour. Uh, so prosecution is really not a great option. Uh, administrative fines, fixed penalty notices, call them what you will, would be certainly a, uh, a boon to us. Um, I'm familiar with the arguments against it uh, in terms of, you know, could it be seen as fundraising, but I believe that the bill is going to deal with that issue by uh, any, any funds raised would go into a central pot anyway, so it wouldn't be a a money-making exercise for councils, or wouldn't be seen to be to be that. I think that's certainly the, the way to go. It, it shouldn't be draconian. It should be preventative. The majority of the the food fraud that we encounter, certainly in Glasgow, surrounds the substitution of meat and fish. It's done on a relatively low scale. It's done primarily just to save money, and it's food fraud, of course it is. But it's uh, it's not in the same league as. Uh, some of the you know the horse meat issues that we saw uh, last year, uh, and I don't think it warrants, uh, or it would certainly doesn't justify pursuing cases through the court and criminalising individuals, small butchers, very often the ethnic community, uh, restaurants where they substitute beef for lamb, for instance, uh, or haddock for whiting, or whiting for haddock is more likely. So I think it's um, yeah there is a need for a, maybe a, a, a more streamlined non-criminal. Uh, sanctions regime, which uh, would certainly, I think, benefit us all, to be truthful, including the industry to a great extent. The industry calls for the level playing field, and I think that we can deliver that better 
with a slightly more uh, flexible system. Well, What's the current? A few. You actually go in. Interim was one to Sorry. My apologies. your first question. Yes, could I, could I come in and say I, I had experience of a butcher who, who he, he, he killed some people with his bad meat, but he was also selling, he was also selling uh, um, what he said was Welsh lamb, but it was actually New Zealand mutton. Uh, but he wasn't prosecuted. He wasn't, there was, you know, that was just a, a, an incidental thing. And I would agree very strongly that we do need a, a, a much better way of, of sorting out this problem, which is, is probably quite common. And it, it's not like the horse meat thing in, in, in the sense it would, it would immediately come up if you started testing on the basis of intelligence. It, it, it's a small thing, uh, but, but maybe quite common. Although, of course, one must remember the, 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 the Shetland fish thing, which was on a grand scale. And, and, but clearly that really needed forensic accountants rather than anybody else to bring the prosecution. Richard? Again, basically the, the situation, in your experience, what's the average fine that someone's fined if, if, if you found, them, found something to be wrong in the premises? I'm probably not the best person to ask in the sense that, uh, in my authority, uh, a policy is, is largely to avoid prosecution simply because it's become incredibly ineffective in that we have one case, just as an example, one case uh, pending just now for food hygiene offences. Um, it's been now well over two years. Um, we haven't heard a thing about it. You know, the, uh, In several months, it may not even come to court now. It may, you know, it's just rather disappeared into a hole in the ground. It's not seen as by an effective, as an effective method uh, of, of enforcing food law and, and, and protecting public health. I understand that, that the public seeks a, 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 would require a request that to happen, but it's um, it's not really in our best interest, and I don't think it's really in the public's best interest for that to be the, the main thrust of our actions. I'm sorry, I don't know what the average fine would be though these days. You would wel welcome any changes that would uh, save, uh, you know, the frustrations that you sometimes feel? Very much so, very much so. I think there are certainly items within the bill which will deliver that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Governor. Just, just very briefly on that, I'm interested in questions by my colleague Richard Lyle. And I think, again, Mr Hamilton has given very useful evidence in relation to uh, the need for the, the, the fixed penalty notices contain contained within the bill and you've given a, a fairly strong reason for why they go to a central port rather than back to local authority so there's there's, there's, there's no conflicts there um, my, my question again probably for mr hamilton because you're involved in the enforcement side of things um, um in terms of the use of fixed penalty notices which i i know very little about i have to admit but i'd imagine if you if you're a uh, have a family business it's a fish and chip shop uh, you're substituting whiting for haddock you only have one outlet and there's a fixed penalty notice on you, the burden of that fixed penalty notice would be far greater than, say, if you had a chain of 20 stores across West Central Scotland and you may only have been caught in one of your stores. Can fixed penalty notices take account of the scale of your business network? Or uh, will it disproportionately, if you like, affect smaller retailers, producers and outlets. I'm just, just wondering if that's something that's been done before. It's always dangerous when they're asking a question when you don't have a clue what the answer is going to be, but just in terms of making sure it's proportionate on, on industry. To be honest, there's, um, there's existing schemes at the moment, or legislation like the Environmental Protection Act, which enable us to serve notice, you know, I see as I mean local authorities, um, and there is very little consideration, to be truthful, given to you know, the, the capability of, of businesses to, to cope with the actual costs involved. Uh, and I would certainly argue that um, if there were to be a fixed penalty regime or anything of that sort introduced in, in food law, that it would have to be um, very robust. Uh, I think local authorities would have to exercise their... Uh, or be, be called to account to exercise uh, you know, transparency, accountability, etc., proportionality, uh, and there would need to be a, quite a clear code of practice covering uh, the, the means by which it would do, the notices would be served, uh, and uh, perhaps there would be a sliding scale in terms of uh, uh, the degree of the fine, the level of the fines. I would suggest, but uh, I certainly take on board there is a there is potential there for it to be disproportionately uh, punitive. 
I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be fixed penalty fines. I'm just trying to work out how the impact will, will be across various businesses. That's very helpful, Convener. Thank you. Yes, please. Please. Yeah, there, there is a review going through Europe just now, which is, to use the jargon, the 882-2004 review of official controls funding of. And at one stage, they're talking about having a minimum 1 million euros for the, the business, whether you take action or not take action. And they're talking about the number of employees in the business. You say it was 20 employees. Would that be well, if you had two people in the kitchen they don't comply, or if it's a hotel, do you include all the cleaners? So we, I presume the lawyers have looked at the bill and make sure that they're, they're not going to cut across what's coming out of Europe, or there may be additional uh, penalties and offences coming out of Europe through the review of 88 to 2004. Well, that's a new one on me, so thank you very much for, for, for giving me that information. Thank you. Thanks, back to this challenge. I mean, I've, we've been out and about and heard some evidence. We've had an evidence session last week and an evidence session this week, and there's lots of opportunities in the bill. But I just want, you know, you know, I'm still um, a bit uncertain about what the outcomes will be. You know, when I hear the evidence that says, well, just as I heard there, that lots of um, um, powers and regulation come out of Europe. So that's, not, yeah, that's not going to change. Powers of inspection lie with local authorities. I don't know if that's going to change. In fact, I heard yesterday uh, a, meet, a meeting locally that, that, that lo the local authorities and health and care partnerships are, are worrying now about who will be carrying the health message. Will it be the, 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 the health service or will it be local authorities? And, you know, uh, you know, and we heard evidence last week that the labelling regime where we've already got powers has not been used, but it could be slightly different. So, I think I asked the question last week, what's the point? Will this, will this help us tackle, you know, what, what would the outcomes be? Will it help us tackle uh, obesity? Will it, you know, or, or can we do some of these things? Will it uh, give us a new focus on E. coli and, and the, the, the other Scottish problems that we have? You know, somebody, I don't, you know, I'm, Tell me that this will make things better someday. Simple, uh, yes. a, a simple answer, Chairman. Uh, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. And it will depend entirely on how well the body works. Uh, it, it's essentially going to be very similar to what we've got already. Uh, it will have a few extra powers here and there. It will be able to take a few more extra powers here and there as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be down to how well it works, how, how and I think the, the composition of the board is going to be very important to get the right people on that board, getting that message across, um, and, you know, sounding the drum whenever is necessary. Uh, and also, of course, there are other big issues which, which are not addressed in the bill, which couldn't be addressed in the bill, like, for example, local authority funding, because, you know, the enforcement is done by local authorities, and the new body will obviously have a role in making sure the local authorities are doing their work properly, but it will be dependent quite a lot, in fact, to an enormous degree, on how other people are comporting themselves. And I think it is, I'd like to just get that written into the record that, uh, this, this is a crucially important issue, um, and of course it's the same with the public analysts as well, that we, we do need to have a whole system across the country that, that's fit for purpose, and the body itself will have a big role in, in, uh, in keeping that going, and that's why it's important that the body itself will have very, very good, robust relationships with the Scottish Government, in the sense that if it sees a problem, it can uh, appraise government of that problem, even if it's not a problem at which it can do anything about itself. But like, for example, making sure that we have got the right enforcement structure in Scotland, we have got the local authorities appropriately funded with the uh, appropriate numbers of staff. And if I could just finish by saying, I gave evidence to a, a Welsh Assembly Committee uh, 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 um, in, in the back of the public inquiry I did in the, uh, in the, um, the, the Welsh um, the South Wales uh, E. coli outbreak. And I raise this question there about local authorities and enforcement because there were problems with that, but there were problems in other areas as well. There were problems with uh, the meat hygiene service. There were problems right throughout the system. There were problems in procurement uh, by, by the education authorities in terms of the food that they were buying. And 
I would, ex I, I would see there are major opportunities for the board, but there are also major hazards. If it doesn't have the right board calling the, the shots in the right sort of way, it doesn't have the right level of funding, and it doesn't have the right level of support from government, um, we're not going to be as good as we are at the moment. So I, I can leave it on that slightly negative, but positive note in the sense that there is a way forward. We all, we all agree that to have the opportunity, we need a board. We need... We are, I think, all agreed on that, are we? I think we've come to the end of our session, but, you know, there is an opportunity. If there are areas that you feel that um, we've, we've also got your written evidence, but there are areas that you feel that we could have touched on this morning that you want to leave us with a last thought, then you have the opportunity now. Um, and obviously, yes, but we'll I'll come back to you. And obviously, if, you know, you're on the, the way back home and something comes into your mind that, that you feel that the committee needed to take into consideration, then please follow the, the, the committee's work and, and, and email us. It doesn't need to be as informal as this. Um, what would we be to for the last word? Yeah, I'd just like you're following up on what Pew, uh, Hugh was saying there. Yes. You're asking the new food body to do more th with less. Because you know, if you look at the, the budget, you're depending on uh, FSA UK putting some money back up to Aberdeen. So there's a lot of imponderables there, and you're asking it to do more. So that's the challenge. How can you do more with less? Is that possible? Or do you need to fund this body adequately to do the job? Well, we'll examine that in future, future sessions. Thank you all for your attendance and the time you've given this morning. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. I suspend at this point um, while we...
Wunderschön. Um, as a, as, 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 where am I? Um, I think we have agreed um, um, by silence, at least that uh, we, we're all agreed that we'll introduce ourselves as 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 we come in and ask ask questions. Um, and as normal with the round table say, it says, I will give uh, the floor to um, uh, the uh, panelists here today. Um, Richard, could I have the first question from you, Richard Simpson? The um 2003 Act was the first one where Scotland actually led the way in the United Kingdom. Previous, all previous mental health acts were created at the UK Parliament and then essentially chartonised. So the introduction of the Milan Principles were clearly very, very important at that time. And uh, I think my question would be whether the, you know, the, the revision which we're now proposing is appropriate and whether they. Uh, particularly things like the compulsory treatment orders and the community aspect of that has worked and whether we you know whether we we really need revisions or, and I know we've had evidence from people but what do they feel uh, about the the McManus report and the and the revisions that are proposed to come in I think that um, we would sorry I'm Carolyn Roberts <laughs> I knew you were just about to ask me. I'm Carolyn Roberts. I'm the Head of Policy and Campaigns at SAMH, which is the Scottish Association for Mental Health. Um, I think that the, the Mental Health Act, as you say, was groundbreaking in Scotland when it was first introduced, and it has, um, it has human rights at its heart. It has a number of, of really welcome provisions. In terms of where we are now, we're looking at the, um, the, the new bill being introduced, uh, I believe, later on this month. The, the draft that we have seen so far we had a number of concerns about elements of McManus that were not included. We felt that McManus was a very comprehensive and a very thorough review. And as you know, it's taken some time to get to the point where we're actually seeing um, a response in, in the shape of this new bill. Um, we have, have submitted a, a very thorough response to the bill, but a few areas that I would highlight of, of concern um, were around the, the medical reports, the, the consultation draft that we saw um, suggested that it would be possible to detain someone on the basis of only one report. We were, were very concerned about that. Um, we would like to see some, some different changes than those that are proposed being made to named persons. Um, the, the Scottish Government stated an intention that no one should have a named person if they did not actually choose to do one. But that is not the, the, um, that's not the effect of the, the, the actual bill. Um, and we have a number of other concerns about the absence of advocacy, which I think is one of the areas that was um, a real strength of the original bill, giving the, the right to advocacy. I, I don't think that that has been fully realised, and we're, we're disappointed not to see more of that in the, the new bill. So obviously we'll wait to see um, the revised version that will come out, but, but those are a few of the concerns that we had initially. Anyone else? Voices of Experience. I am um, wanting to add to that, Carolyn, thank you. Obviously, we were in agreement with all of the issues that Carolyn's raised. I think I'd just like to add that we had been looking for, and as indeed was raised by McManus, an onus on an individual to drive forward the completion of uh, the advanced statement provision, um, meaning that they would, they would suggest somebody from the care team that had the responsibility for that. I think that's a really good idea in terms of the, the recent talks about where incapacity is being challenged, the idea that you're meant to look for and make every uh, opportunity to have um, supported decision-making as opposed to um, you know, taking decisions away from the service user. Director for Mental Health in NHS Ayrs and Arm, but I'm here as a frontline RCN member. Um, our concerns relate to nurses holding powers and the provision or the proposal to change the length of time and uh, we don't agree with it in terms of reciprocity and the fact that the Act was based on rights. 
we see this infringing on rights. There is, as we see it, no need to change and extend the time for holding. The nurse's holding powers is two hours. If a doctor arrives before the end of the two hours, there's a further hour with which nurses can still detain. So then to change the Act and say that we can, as a nurse can have the power to detain someone even when there's a doctor present, I don't think is placing on service the reciprocity that's based within the Act itself. It becomes a workforce issue as opposed to saying, well, actually, what is more important that someone is doing than attending to someone who we are considering detention? So by the very dint of that, it means that they are unwell and we should prioritise that. So we didn't agree uh, in relation to that as RCM members. And the Mental Health Nurse Forum Scotland also discussed it as a senior group of mental health nurses in Scotland, and they don't agree with that either, that provision. There is no need to change it. And none of us understand where it came from or what the driver for that change is. Convener Chris O'Sullivan from the Mental Health Foundation. Um, we we agree with, with with all of those points, in fact, and, and we've we've echoed those in, in, in our submission. Um, and the two things that really I came to, to concentrate on today were about equity and equalities um, and about mainstreaming mental health. And I think both of those things deserve to be explored in the process of discussing the bill uh, and potentially in terms of opening up further the discussion in the bill process. Um, I think the, the draft bill that was discussed was extremely technical uh, or appeared extremely technical on the face of it to many stakeholders um, and uh, as Richard Simpson rightly pointed out uh, in, in the process of creating the 2003 Act Scotland took regard of the differences in mental health in Scotland and the work that had been done on the various national programme activities. And it would be fair to say, I think, from our perspective, that the paradigm has shifted again in Scotland in that 10 years. Um, and the discussion of a new bill uh, and a potential new piece of mental health law deserves to be examined in the light of the ways that those paradigms have shifted. Um, we would like to see the discussions on the bill particularly focus on those groups who are subject to inequalities. Uh, some of the ways in which the Bill's provisions and the existing Act's provisions are um, applied to people from inequality groups, asylum seekers and refugees, for example, young people, uh, and where does their right to things like advocacy and other stuff work. Uh, and we would also like to see the uh, Bill revisit sections 25 to 31, which deal with the obligations on local authorities to promote recovery and access to other services like employability and education, all of which are bound up in issues around welfare reform and other things which I'm sure will come up today but which deserve an airing in the way that local authorities are able to mainstream their work on mental health in the context of single outcome agreements and other activities which are all new since the 2003 Act. Yes, please. Um, Shabeen Begum, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance. We were really concerned about the lack of mentioning, uh, mention of independent advocacy in the, in the new bill. We feel that um, the, the, that was one of the strengths of the original legislation, that it was the first piece of legislation in the UK to give people a right of access to independent advocacy. And we think that what actually happens in practice um, throughout Scotland isn't, uh, doesn't actually reflect the rights that people have in the legislation. Um, access to advocacy has been really, really patchy over the last few years. Um, certain groups still don't have the, the levels of access that they should do. We've produced various pieces of research, and most recently the Mental Welfare Commission published some research yesterday that said that people with dementia still didn't have access to advocacy. Lots of people still don't know about advocacy. They, they talked about you Units that hadn't had any kind of input from advocacy for the last six months. We're really concerned about those sorts of developments. And as other people have said, advocacy safeguards people's rights. It, in, it makes sure that people have access to the right kind of support and, and, and care and treatment. And we think that this was a missed opportunity. There needed to be something that strengthened people's right to access independent advocacy and also to remind local authorities and health boards about their duties to make sure that there is appropriate levels of access. So people with learning difficulties, older people, people with dementia, children and young people are the gaps in provision that we see all the time. We're in the process of developing, uh, of, of uh, producing some new research 
And one of the, the target groups in that research has been mental health service users and the number of times that it's quite disheartening and quite depressing, really, because the number of people who say, I wish I'd, somebody had told me about advocacy years ago because it would have made a huge difference to my life and I might not be in the situation that I'm in, kind of recognising the role of advocacy in terms of prevention in terms of avoiding situations becoming more, and dif more difficult and more complex, and also helping people to, uh, on the road to recovery so that when advocacy is involved, people have a, a stronger sense of control, they have more choices, they have, they, they have the ability to make better decisions and hopefully avoid situations from escalating. So we're really concerned that, that the bill doesn't recognise the importance of advocacy. Anyone else? Please. Carol Allen here on behalf of the British Psychological Society. Um, can we say we, we, we strongly support the principles of, of the new bill? And, um, but, but can I reflect some, some of the previous comments? It, it clearly is tightly drafted and it looks as though it's meeting a legislative framework rather than looking at understandably a legislative framework, but rather than reflecting some of the developments and changes that we've seen over the last 10 years in terms of how mental health is now delivered in Scotland. So we would very much like to see this reflected in the new bill in terms of expanding the mandated treatment available to people within this type of situation. For example, input to families in terms of psychological care, um, where that's appropriate. Um, interestingly, developments in England in terms of the mental health bill there have expanded the role of other clinicians in terms of providing specialist reports and the role of responsible clinician has now developed and the British Psychological Society has supported psychologists to appropriately qualified psychologists to take on that role and appropriately qualified nurses are also taking on that role in England and we particularly note the suggestion that one report could be used and we, we echo the concerns from other consultation responses about that and again we appreciate there may be resource issues but again perhaps this is the opportunity for the bill to look more widely in terms of who can take on roles of providing a second opinion. For example, there are issues that are more clearly psychological, for example, within learning disability, um, in, in areas where there may be neuropsychological difficulty. The, 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 there are areas which would sit with, well with the expertise of psychologists. So we would very, be very keen that, that that would be looked at. Thank you. Any other, do, you do you want to, to add some comments, surely? Yeah, Mr. Barth. It, it was um, merely to say that I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with Carol on extending the role of the nurse into what would previously be an MHO role and the MHO role provides a safeguard. And so I'm not sure that we would support nurses taking on the same role as they do down in England. I, I think, can I say, I, I think that's a legi legitimate view. But what will be helpful is there will be information coming from England about how this is working, who's taken on those rules, and whether, in fact, those safeguards are there. So I, I, I think it's to be investigated and evaluated. It, it's simply a comment. And, 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 of course, I can't speak on behalf of nurses. I wouldn't dream of it. Richard? Yes, it's, it's been a very useful uh, introduction. I should have declared a couple of interests as a fellow of the College of Psychiatry, but also I have a chair in psychology at University of Stirling. I mean, I think this named person thing is really very interesting. I think, the, you know, I just wonder whether others would like to comment on that because I think the, you know, the roles are definitely changing of individuals. I mean, if you go back... 40 years to nurses' role, it was quite different to what it is now. And the range of roles has become quite different. Same with psychologists. In 1979, you couldn't see a psychologist without being referred by a psychiatrist. And I did some research that showed that that was a complete nonsense, and, and the system then changed. But So should the bill 
be drawn in such a way to allow that possibility that the extension of roles, the extended roles for perhaps limited number of nurses with particular qualifications, but also psychologists and others to provide a second report if it, we retain the second report, which would be another way of tackling it. I just wonder if others have a view on that. What of you? No one? Mr. Barden? Sorry, unsurprising. I, I absolutely support the role of extended nurses. And in Ayrshire, we've got advanced nurse practitioners that in Crosshouse Hospital who do away with the need for psychiatrists overnight. We've on-call consultants, but we don't have junior doctors. So I absolutely agree with that. But there is a bit about having that step away and that protective element that I think we need very careful consideration within the bill. And I get the point about specialist or advanced practice and what we can do, but I would be cautious because currently what we have is a rights-based legislation that protects individuals and a potential of nurses and doctors being too close in one team and what we could do is a risk that needs active consideration. Yeah, um, can I just say that if, if the second report was to replace the general practitioner, I think we are well aware that the general practitioner provision for the second report hasn't worked particularly well. Yeah. Therefore, to substitute another professional in that role is fine. I think what Derek's talking about is the absolute need to have a second report and an MHO safeguarder and not to confuse the two, not to use the MHO's report as the second report in any circumstance, because that should be the sort of inviolate bit of the, of the legislation. Yes, please. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm Karen Addy from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm not a practicing psychiatrist, so I should point that out. But um, I know there are huge problems with getting the, the second report from the GPs, and this is a particular issue in rural areas um, and in areas where they're short on um, junior doctors particularly. And what Derek was saying about getting junior doctors on call overnight. Um, we have recruitment, big recruitment problems in psychiatry, um, and we have gaps in particular bits of the country and in particular specialties. Um, so I think that does need looking at. Thank you. Yes, doctor. Oh, doctor. If I could just make a, a final comment about a, a second independent report. Uh, the, the British Psychological Society has supported psychologists in England with extra training and mentoring around these rules. And I, w I would propose that you know, the Scottish Government could seek information and intelligence about the development of these rules. Um, and as I say, I'm reflecting some of the resource considerations that have been flagged up. But could I also say, um, part of the core role of a psychologist is to be able to assess to be able to be able to produce a report that would be helpful to a tribunal within within these circumstances so I, I think it could be beneficial for the process that would be my, my thinking about this yes please mr Solomon. thank you thank you convener um i was going to make a point which might broaden that discussion out slightly um and, and it relates to um to the point I was making about mainstreaming uh, mental health across a wide range of competencies and, and about anti-stigma work as well. Um, in, in the olden days, it, it, it became uh, the, solely the duty of psychiatrists and, and latterly MHOs to deal with mental health in a, legislat uh, in a, in a legislatively defined manner. Um, and now, as we sit in 2014, there are a whole wide range of legislati legislatively designed um, roles which compel people to act on people's mental health and um, you know for example the role of, of uh, practitioners in self-directed support um, from the recent legislation passed so I guess we would want to see the widest possible uh, workforce involvement and understanding of the complexity of mental health so the broadest range of practitioners from a whole range of different professional backgrounds were able to act within their sphere of professional responsibility in a way that promoted rights and encouraged people uh, people's self-advocacy and the best possible outcomes for their recovery uh, and if that means that in the context of mental health legislation there are options to uh, widen the range of workforce uh, roles 
which have a statutory responsibility, then that, we think, would probably be a good thing to see um, alongside a wider recognition of the impact on mental health that a whole wide range of professions have in different areas of communities and policy. Yes, please. To follow up Can on the, <clears throat> the um, issue around professional roles, I think there are two points. Um, I would first of all support Derek Barron's point about the role of the mental health officer, <clears throat> Excuse me, which is fundamental and which does provide real safeguards. Um, and, and we do have some concerns about the numbers of trainee mental health officers, which has been falling in recent years. I think that's an important point, and I would welcome the committee giving some consideration to that. On the other point about um, the two reports and, and who ought to be able to, um, to provide the second report, what I think will be important as we consider the bill is to define the purpose of the second report and that I think will drive who ought to be able to, to provide that. At the moment what we have focused on is, is a GP report. The reason that we um, are quite positive about GP participation is that it's reasonable to expect that many GPs will have a relationship with the individual they may be able to provide some wider information um, beyond the, the person's immediate state about their experiences, their previous um, condition, perhaps their family circumstances. These things are all very relevant. And so we are keen that GPs do retain a role. I understand that there are practical difficulties often in getting them to participate. I would be concerned about making changes to a process that has such positives purely on the basis of resources and availability, I would prefer that we at least make efforts to address those resource-driven issues before we change um, the system. Th there are something like 1,200 compulsory treatment orders every year and around 4,000 practicing GPs. So I, I don't think those issues ought to be insurmountable. I mean, it, it does, you know, just, it does focus obviously on the crisis and this committee spends a lot of time um, discussing preventative initiatives, etc. And I was, I, mean, I was shocked to see, you know, when some of the evidence in the papers over the weekend about waiting times for psychological therapies. Um, not, you know, it's a, the differences, you know, in some cases between, you know, Glasgow, uh, uh, you know, doing it in seven weeks, 17 weeks in Fort Farley and just within the, the, the 18, the, the, you know, the 18 weeks. And March this year, 2,700 or so on, the, on this paper who, who were waiting beyond 18 weeks. Now, you know, the, 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 there, seems to, there seems to be, of course, in the bill looking at, at the point of crisis, but surely part of this must be looking at how we slow down that point, how we reduce people getting to crisis and um, you know we haven't yeah. mentioned children yet and <laughs> we've had some evidence in the past here mm -hmm. about the, the number of children that we know are presenting at um, uh, social work we're suffering from from emotional abuse which is in the thousands and and and, and the access the, the 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 lack of access that they have for specialist yeah. support yeah, no, yeah, I think that my name is Brian Donnelly. I'm here representing Young Scotland in Mind, which is a, a forum of mainly voluntary sector organisations working with children and young people. It probably is a very relevant time to raise some of the issues um, as this affects children and young people. Um, there's a whole host, to be perfectly honest, that's absent in relation to children and young people. And our members, uh, in terms of even feedback on the proposals in the bill, don't feel that it talks to them or addresses the issues for children and young people at all. Waiting times for children and young people, like others, but it's, it's especially poor. There's issues around um, defining an adult as someone over 16. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child says that a, a, ch a child up to the age of 18. <clears throat> and on the back of the new Children and Young People's Bill, if you're looked after and accommodated, you can get a service up to your 25. Between the ages of 16 and 18 is historically poor in any service, but we're looking at a particularly vulnerable group here, especially children that have been looked after. They're disproportionately affected by poor mental health. Almost half of them leave care with a diagnosed mental health condition. And these are the people that fall through the cracks and come into the adult services at the point of crisis later on. Um, there's a real lack of community-based engagement with the third sector, preventative work. There's a lot of sporadic things going on, but it's not usually joined up with um, some of the bigger budgets or the bigger services that, that are there. And I think 
sadly, the draft of the bill that we've looked at doesn't really do a great deal to address that because our membership feels that the needs and issues that affect children and young people are absent from it. They're not an add-on group. They're not an equalities group. They are themselves an entire population. They are affected by parental mental health, and the biggest indicator of their mental health and well-being can be particularly their mother's mental health. But uh, uh, there's a there's a considerable gap there, I think. Um, the third sector has got lots of ideas in relation to this and is looking for partnerships and wants to see more community-based work, would like to see more work being done, um, having you know, CAMs linked to schools and information around things like self-harm, which just don't exist in schools. We've surveyed our membership on that, and these are significant issues. So um, without trying to grab all of that, that's just skimming the surface, I think. Is it? And, but really, prevention. Um, the opportunities to take a more preventative approach um, would be very well supported and echoed by the, the children's sector. Anyone else? Come. Could I just add something again on psychiatric recruitment to that? Because I've had an update from our child and adolescent psychiatry um, faculty in the last couple of days and recruitment of psychiatric trainees to hire specialist training, so that's the last two years before they become a consultant, is becoming an increasing problem. That's across all psychiatric specialties and doctors in general in Scotland. Um, but as anticipated, there will be an increasing shortfall in consultant numbers. So these people are seeing the most ill and the most severe um, psychiatric illnesses, but you know there are going to be gaps in that psychiatric workforce. Um, out of vacancies recently, there was six ST4 vacancies advertised in child and adolescent psychiatry, and only one was filled. Um, three vacancies in Forth Valley for consultant jobs, and all last week, all three candidates withdrew. So there, there are problems, you know, expectations around legislation and, you know, beefing up the services and reducing the waiting times, but, you know, there are there are definitely going to be problems in the psychiatric workforce. So I don't want to depress anybody any further. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Allen, and and then Mr. O'Sullivan. Can I just pick up on some some of the the comments that Brian made about CAMS links and schools? Um, I mean, paradoxically. Um, there are cuts to educational psychology. Psychologists who are, are linked to schools, currently linked to schools, um, their workforce planning predicts that over the next four or five years, maybe a quarter of them will retire. Local authority budgets, of course, are strained and under threat, and posts are not filled. And again, I'm sure people are aware that postgraduate funding for educational psychology has been completely withdrawn. It's the opposite problem that Karen has, has delineated. People want to become educational psychologists. It's an enormously popular career route for people. But the bottleneck, there are bottlenecks in, in our system. And these are people who work with some very disadvantaged children. Um, CAMS links, of course, but Let's think about an integrated and joined up system in terms of the support that educational psychologists can provide to these very vulnerable groups. Mr. Sullivan. Thank, thanks very much. Um, uh, I would like to make a couple of points about uh, young people's mental health. Um, certainly, uh, there are some, there's some knowledge that we've acquired over the past three, few years, both in Scotland and in the wider UK. And across the UK, we had a programme called uh, Right Here, which worked with 16 to 24s um, in, in five centres across, uh, across the UK, um, recognising that there was a gap in both service provision and in citizenship and uh, around mental health for 16 to 24s. And that, that program has developed some interesting recommendations, which I'm sure we'll have a, an opportunity to feed in in evidence to, to the committee later on. Um, but one of the things that our work with young people has really shown us is something which came up in the Christie um, re review about co-design and the importance of involving people um, and the value and imagination that young people bring to both defining their problems and innovating solutions that perhaps the adults in their lives and those of us 
I, I say us, those of you perhaps in, in, in positions of power or uh, perhaps uh, don't get so much, and I would really hope to see that the committee would take evidence from young people and others. Um, one project that I would bring to your mind, NHS Greater in Glasgow and Clyde uh, invited us to work with young Scott um, in helping them to work with young people to see how they could involve digital in their young people's mental health strategy because they recognised that young people were operating pretty much seamlessly online and offline uh, and that they had a reasonable demand for their mental health services to include online dimensions and also were mindful of the fact that young people engaged in all sorts of strategies, both positive and negative, to help them manage their distress earlier than the point that they might need CAMs. Um, which reflects more widely in the sense that we need to ensure that there are options available for all population groups to self-manage distress uh, and find their way to support downstream of the specialist services like CAMS, which are so bottlenecked. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, yes, just to... Obviously, the, the community situation is, is not good, but I would like to keep people's minds on the top of the pyramid where um, specialist services um, send, tend to see our young people sent down to England in particular circumstances and I think that's something that we should be keeping our eye on as well. Okay. Yes, go on. Thank you for bringing it up and a reminder that it's particularly in areas like forensic adolescent beds and CAM stroke learning disability. There is no inpatient provision um, for those in Scotland and they tend to get shipped out across the border at great cost, not in just in terms of financial cost, but in human cost to their families and those that are trying to support them. It's also quite difficult to get them back once you've sent them. Any other? Chris? Um, I wonder if... Uh, Perhaps I could um, bring up another population group um, for, for the committee's attention. Uh, another group which is not one of the specific inequality groups, but is a large population in Scotland, and that's people with long-term conditions. Um, having a long-term condition is, is, is greatly associated with a greater risk of, of poor mental health or mental health problems. So 30% of people with diabetes develop depression. Um, you're twice as likely to have depression if you have coronary heart disease, and if you have coronary heart disease and depression, you're twice as likely to die of your coronary heart disease, which itself makes a compelling argument for addressing the mental health of people with long-term conditions. But the King's Fund did a very interesting study in 2011 on the economic costs, and they discovered from their economic modelling that mental health problems raised the total health care costs by 45%. For each person with a long-term condition and a comorbid mental health problem, which equates to around one pound of every eight pounds being spent on long-term conditions being spent on the mental health aspect of long-term conditions. Um, so we feel that there is a need to recognise and engage that more in Scotland. A lot of work has been done by us, um, the Royal College of GPs and a range of other um, areas in terms of peer support for managing the long-term conditions uh, and mental health problems. There's some good studies going on about mental health support in cancer and other areas, but this is an area of great potential for addressing some of Scotland's challenges, both in terms of long-term conditions and in terms of the kind of complexity and multimorbidity which is so often behind the health inequalities we know are so acute in this country. Thank you. Bob? Yeah. Thanks. It's really interesting. I think it's useful to put on the record that we are listening to what you're saying about um, workforce planning and vacancies and recruitment, and it's a complicated web, and I, th I think all of us as committee members, I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us, we've, we've taken that on board. Um, but the, the solutions is quite often going back towards preventative or not exacerbating uh, mental health issue, issues as, as they come in. And a slightly tangential example, I do a lot of work with the, the continence management service in the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. A lot of the older population uh, first present with mental health issues because they become housebound because of continence issues and other issues kick in. So whatever the trigger is, there's always a trigger for one aspect of the population. So I know there's some, some positive work around that in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but sometimes where mental health issues kick in, there's a variety of partnership work. So for example, the Notre Dame Centre in Glasgow do some excellent work with kinship care children in particular. Could be better funded, but they do some good work around that. Last week I was in, in Postle Park looking at a new link worker service 
uh, around GPs practices uh, uh, the, the, the deep end project about taking some of that softer empathy skills needed in healthcare away from frontline GPs to others. The reason, given that I mentioned both those things, they, uh, neither of those initiatives are straightforward referral clinical processes for mental health. And uh, th th there seems to be a patchwork quilt of good practice out there, whether it's for young people, whether it's for older people, whether it's for those suffering the effects of uh, welfare reform. How do you... It's a huge issue to ask any government or any local authority or health board to coordinate that together in some kind of coherent way. So I guess, I guess I'm looking for a steer in relation to we can talk about a mental yeah. health strategy, but when the solutions are very often local <coughs> and, and unique to each local area, how do we share best practice across the country, or could you give me some other things we could be doing? I think I would find that helpful as, a, as an MSP. Lots of hands there, Bob. Yeah. So, Brian, yeah. um, anything, Dr. Allen? I, I think um, one of the things that we have to do, the point's very well made. Um, people from a social care background have a different focus. Um, children that maybe experience um, abuse or neglect or violence at home get a social care service that can be about prevention, it can be about managing risk, but it's not always about managing the impact of that trauma on their life and their, as, as that goes on through their life. The challenge that particularly faces young people is, um, we need, we, I won't be the first person to say this, but the thinking is in silos. Adult mental health over here, community stuff over here, and children and young people is a completely different, um, it's got different money, it's got different ministerial responsibility, and there has to be um, a way of, of looking locally at what people have got, mapping that out and putting it around so that if you work in a school and self-harm is an issue, you should know where to look um, what you know? What, what's going to point you in the direction of well? What voluntary sector services out there in my area that that can come in and work in partnership with us in this, rather than um, the sort of tried and tested medical and professional routes? We do. It's said a million times, and I know it's an easy answer, but um, funding and thinking tends to come a very top down with a very narrow focus, and we need to not be scared to to throw that open and, and start talking about what communities have got and look at community assets and mapping right across the whole social care. I mean, children in school now, the curriculum for excellence, health and wellbeing is a core part of the curriculum. It's the responsibility of all teachers. Um, the new Children and Young People's Bill is asking all paid professionals to share concerns about welfare, not just well -be about wellbeing for children and young people. That's a significant change in what professors are going to have to act on. It's not just about risk anymore. It can be about um, their mum was hospitalised at the weekend or they're not getting fed. These professionals are going to have to share these concerns. It has to be joined up. Otherwise, um, we'll just keep doing the same stuff over and over again. Dr Allen. Can I say, I don't have a complete answer to, to the challenge you said, um, but, but, but I am hoping that the integration of health and social care will start to provide us with some answers. But I think the point is well made that as the population ages, comorbidity and complexity will be what we are all dealing with. And comor comorbid physical and mental health problems, they do coalesce together. And the King's Fund and Lord Layard have been eloquent about the costs and difficulties. For example, it's extremely difficult to engage somebody in managing a long-term health condition if they're also anxious and depressed. So ignoring it is, is, is not an option. The other thing is, managing these chronic condi conditions is, is about managing them. There isn't a pill that's going to sort anything out. It is about the kind of lifestyle choices that people find it very difficult to make when they're poor and they're up against it. So it is about more exercise, stopping smoking, drinking a lot less, those kind of things. But the way, the way I look at it is it's a kind of stepped care model. There's a huge amount that can be done in the community and there's some fantastic projects around that. Um, and there are levels of complexity. You wouldn't expect um, a, a kind of tertiary care service to, 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 to deliver those, the, the kind of broad interventions. Can I, and again, maybe declare an interest, 
NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has invested quite a lot of money in terms of psychology support for the acute services. There are more psychologists working in obesity than in addiction problems in Glasgow, mm -hmm. which is quite something, I think. Um, but, but the problems associated with obesity are huge in, in, in the west of Scotland. And the model is psychological. All the treatment isn't given by a psychologist, but the model is psychological. And they have outreach work within the community, but there are also more complex cases that are seen within a hospital, perhaps the kind of people who may, may progress to surgery. Um, so it's levels of care that I think we're thinking about. But the bulk is always going to be dealt with within a community setting using a range of providers who are close to where the client or patient is. I think I've got uh, Chris Sullivan. Chris O'Sullivan. Visit visitors arriving. Um, you asked you asked for some solutions, Mr. Doris, and I, I don't think think, think solutions are, are immediately apparent, but I, I have some thoughts. Um, first off, at, at the level of, of, of government and legislation, I, I and we believe that there should be a mental health impact assessment of, of, of policy and practice. So what is the impact on mental health? We can demonstrate and the evidence supports the fact that there is a mental health dimension to most public policy decisions and understanding that and, and framing that through legislation and guidance can be very, very helpful in enabling workforce groups uh, and the people uh, implementing that legislation on the ground in local authorities to make the time to include mental health. Um, downstream of that, assuming that there is a mental health dimension of any inequality or health um, interaction, uh, in fact most public service interactions, is very useful at a ground level and your continent service example is, is, is a perfect example of a service which is not mental health but when it recognises its ability to both encounter and engage with mental health has the potential for um, great benefits on that. And um, I believe that, that all public service employees in Scotland should be minimally equipped to compassionately deal with disclosures of distress. So any public servant in Scotland should be able to recognise the signs that somebody might be experiencing distress, have a conversation about that with them in a confident and comfortable manner and help them if they want to, to make the first step on addressing that and be that in a continent service, a welfare advice service, a noise abatement team uh, or, or whatever. That should be a professional competence of people on the ground. Um, I also think, and linked to that, that peer support has a great role to play. We've considered where that fits in mental health, and there's a good evidence base for that. And we've done some work in transplanting peer support uh, from mental health to both long-term conditions and also now uh, to, to carers as well. But there's an element of that in professions as well, and helping people to professionally use their own experiences and be comfortable in doing that is a potential avenue forward. Complexity, I completely agree um, with, with Dr. Allen, is, is where it's at. We are no longer able to conceive of a situation where people come to a GP, a social worker, or, or any other public service interaction with one problem that requires one appointment and one appointment for each thing, because people exist in a web of complexity which usually includes mental health, long-term conditions, and other social issues. And we need to gear both our policy environment and our practice environment to engaging with complexity and helping people to unpick that. And there is some promising practice which enables that to happen, both from things like DeepEnd and from things like uh, the PCAM complexity assessment tool, which is being developed in Edinburgh and Stirling and trialled at the moment, and indeed some of the approaches to engaging with distress and trauma and other things which are in the current mental health strategy, which we hope will show promise over the next few years. Derek Barton. The, the point was echoing somewhat what uh, Dr. Allen's already said. Actually, integration is allegedly the answer. That's the whole purpose of integration of what we aim to do and try to do it. Because right now we've got different organisations doing different things and sometimes the same things doing it twice. I mean, just in my own um, North Ayrshire Shadow Integration Board, we had a discussion, I think, the money that the health service is spending on learning disabilities and having out of area placements and what our local authority colleagues are spending in terms of, of learning disability, the potential to bring it together and to do it possibly better and cheaper, which means we've got more money for other things, actually increases what we're doing. So part of the answer, is, I don't mean to be glib, is, is integration. That otherwise, why are we doing integration? 
So it's not going to be a magic wand. It's going to take us a, a time to get there. But that's the purpose of it. And if that's not the purpose, then we're wasting our time because we're going to work together on things. And on our Shadow Integration Board, we have got the third sector, we have got uh, voluntary organisations, we have got carers groups, and we have got users groups. So around that, what we aim to do is, what is it we need locally, and how do we tailor that to what is the local needs, which might be children, it might be older adults, it might be any care group in the middle. It's that well, the totality of it. So part of the solution without being glib is uh, integration is the answer. I think was that not Brian's point? Easier said than done. I mean, even you know, leaving out local, local authorities, leave out adult services, children's services, community services, all with the same professionals are, are, are yeah, working in silos, you know, as Brian said. The, the mental health silo, but then you've got the children's silo, and then you've got the children's mental health one as well. It's it's um... so it's a challenging report to a single director, which we do. All of those silos actually meet at one point who's responsible for it and then responsible to elected members, responsible to the, the population, responsible to the health board. It, it all meets an integration, whereas right now it doesn't meet in a single place. So if you've got one person who's accountable for it, it is a little bit easier to say, well, actually, you have to balance your responsibilities. But what we haven't got is what Chris described as um, um, a mental health impact assessment. We don't know, we're not measuring those outcomes. But we can quite easily ad identify all the inputs and all of the salaries. But we, yes, Bob. I didn't expect anyone to have all the answers. I wanted to tease out some of the good things that are going on where we have to go further. Um, it's a long time since we've looked at single outcome agreements. Uh, convener, is there a mental health outcome uh, indicator within single outcome agreements? Because that will then progress on to local plans in terms of integration and the like. Chris, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, on, on, on the ground, we've, um, we've worked with, with several local authorities now. Um, back in, uh, in, in, at the beginning of single outcome agreements, um, we were asked by uh, um, Glasgow City Council to help them to engage some of their departments that weren't explicitly about mental health and the delivery of mental health outcomes, both in terms of what they were obliged to do under sections 25 to 31 of the Act and in terms of their obligations under uh, the single outcome agreements to reduce suicide and improve um, subjective well-being. And we developed a programme of work which we did with Glasgow and subsequently we did with the three Ayrshire local authorities and now with Highland on, we, it's called our mainstream in mental health programme. Um, and what we've done in that is, is for each area, we, we interview service leads about where mental health fits in with their work and encourage them to connect their single outcome obligations, both the explicit ones in relation to mental health around suicide and, and, and well-being, but also their implicit ones, um, which are many and varied, um, and create a space for them to come together to discuss that, to realise what their role in mental health is, and to create a mini action plan for developing that. And it comes up with some very interesting discussions when you have the guy who runs the lighting strategy saying, what's, what's lighting got to do with mental health? And you say, well, well, why are you doing this lighting strategy? And he goes, well, we want to connect communities and get people to be able to walk safely at night. Well, what does that do for them? It makes them feel more comfortable where they are. Well, what does that do for your mental health? Oh. You know, or the guy in, uh, in Ayrshire who, who ran the team around the team who does the, the house um, renovations when someone's in hospital, and he said to, said to us, we're not mental. We're not mental. Why are we here? Um, and they thought they were coming to a mental health training to learn about mental illness. Um, and I said to him, why do, you, why do you do what you do? Well, we, we change people's houses for them when they're ill, so when they come out of hospital, they're better. But, but we, we're, like, we're better than some councils, because some councils, they just do the bedroom and the kitchen, whereas we do the garden. Why do you do the garden? So that people can get outside and keep in touch with their neighbours so they don't lose touch. Oh. And by the end of the day, they were talking about using their own time to go and work with some people with mental health problems to build a garden in a community in that bit of Ayrshire um, that everybody in the community could involve. So oftentimes we find uh, on a practitioner level, it's about flicking the switch, realising that mental health is not a psychiatrist's job, but a competence that we all have. And at a strategic level, getting a service lead to recognise that his obligations under a single outcome agreement have lots and lots of mental health relevance and not just in the suicide and wellbeing section. Bob, uh. so, I know so you wanted to come in. encouraging Caroline to come in at I this was. point, were you? <laughs> You've been prompted, Caroline. Go. Thank you, Karen. 
Um, I think on the point about single outcome agreements specifically, when we have looked at them um, with a view to finding out how much they um, incorporate mental health, what we find is that, as, as Chris has said, it tends to be very much driven by areas where there are heat targets. So we've seen that there are indicators within um, single outcome agreements about suicide, about um, psychological therapies. These are good and important things, and it's one of the reasons why we think targets are helpful, because it gets um, issues onto people's agenda. But it's, it's not really reflecting mental health in its more broad sense. Um, Scotland has actually done a great deal of good work in developing mental health data. Um, we have a lot of information now on mental health, on, on outcomes, on what's happening. And there are, in particular, a, a set of both adult and children's mental health indicators, which can be used um, to set outcomes, so that there is a lot of work that we could do there. Um, I would also agree that in response to the initial challenge, the, the answer does lie, I think, with integration. And so we do have a very promising opportunity in front of us um, as we integrate health and social care. Although I, I would point out that the third sector doesn't report to a director within that um, directorate. So it's not quite, as, um, not quite as, as straightforward. It is, however, a very good opportunity. And I think our concern is to ensure that when we are creating these new bodies and these new structures, that we try to ensure that the individual is still at the heart of them. We do have a concern that we're going to create new, new structures, new processes, which can make it very easy to lose sight of the person who is at the heart of all of that. So there's a real opportunity to do better joint work and to integrate, but I, I do think it needs um, a great deal of care to make sure that we don't simply further lose individuals in, in structures. Please, please. And then I'll bring it Everybody's brought it back to the point I was going to make originally. Two things uh, to help with uh, Mr Doris's original um, comments. Commitment 1, we're one of the lead partners for Commitment 1, and it's going to do a mapping of services across the piece, across Scotland, mental health services. It includes voluntary sector contributions, and it's a wee bit wider this time than just, you know, your par for the course uh, statutory delivered services. My second point was going to be about all the good work that's going on about a person-centred care and the collaborative that's been set up across health and social care to get that into the system. And at the very first one of those I went to nationally, the people around the room were let, just saying, let's look to mental health to take a lead in this because quite often we would already engaged across health and social care to drive a, a patient pathway, as it were. Finally, I suppose they've come down to the idea that what you need is person-centred outcomes for the individual, and that's back to Caroline's final point. No matter what's in the outcomes agreements, let's not forget that what we're looking for is outcomes that the person wants for their own life, and that's, that's a whole life, that's not just a mental health life. You know, we not, not it's on my briefing here. You know, it's just, I suppose, the next question is that what happens when issues are identified, like the Mental Welfare Commission identified that there was an increase in detentions by 7%. So, so we've got the information, we know it's not, but what, what makes a difference at that point? So it's a sad point, that I suppose, that it's, it's reactive, but even in that reactive sense, what happens? How do, how, 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 do we, how do we engage with government and the agencies that are responsible to question that increase of 77% uh, detentions? What happens at that point? Yes, Derek. I, th I think the, the figures from the main to welfare accounts, whether it's that or other figures, for example, we talked earlier about nurses holding powers, actually are there to ask a question in the why question, which you've just asked. It's absolutely right. Because actually I'd like to see more nurses holding powers used. I'd like to see that figure go up because that gives people protection under the Act. So an increase in detentions isn't necessarily a bad thing because with it, it brings a protection and a statutory responsibility of what we in service must do to protect the individual, part of which is advocacy, part of which is having an MHO looking over the shoulder of the health professional to say, is this right, is it wrong? That brings a protection with it. So that figure to me asks the question. Let's understand the why. 
Um, I think in response to that, the particular figure that you're quoting, I think, is about an increase in the rate of emergency detentions. And I think that that's a good example of how we can use the kind of excellent data that the Mental Welfare Commission produces to make improvements. So the reason that we would be concerned about an increase in emergency detentions is that they don't have the kind of protections that a short-term detention certificate would have. Um, under a short-term detention, you have a mental health officer involved. You have a lot more protection. So I think that reflects the importance of that data being, being gathered so that we can look at why is that happening. And I noticed um, on the figure you're referring to, there was, um, it was much less likely that there would be an emergency certificate used where there was an intensive home treatment team available. Um, so that tells us something about the kind of services that we need in order to make a difference. And I think that is useful for NHS boards um, in, in doing their planning. I would, I would certainly hope those figures are considered. And I think, I think we've come to the end of this session. We've got another session just after this. And um, we've got all of the written evidence. We've had a broad session here this morning, I think, that, um, that have reflected much of that written evidence. Um, there is the opportunity, you know, if you feel uh, the absolute need to, to say, well, I need to put this point on the record and, and I'll give you that opportunity to do that briefly now if you wish to do so. Uh, on the way home, if you think of uh, something that I wish I had said that, as you often do, then let us know. It doesn't need to be as formal as this. We're quite happy for the class to receive any additional comments about the session uh, and points that you um, may wish to have uh, um, raised. Email us. Um, do anyone, does anyone, yes, Chris, how did, I thought it was going to be you, Chris. Yeah, um, so, so somebody gave me a platform today. Um, there's, 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 there's one issue that I think we haven't had a chance to touch on that, it would, that I think we and others would be grateful if the committee was mindful of, and that's the implementation of self-directed support in relation to mental health. Um, a lot of us are working on this and finding that the implementation of self-directed support for people with mental health problems has been somewhat uh, complicated um, and uh, we would like to see that issue paid close attention to over the over the coming months as the evidence um, around implementation increases we've seen um, some examples of poor implementation some examples of good implementation and some concern from service users and service provider organizations which at some point in the future will need to be aired appreciate you taking that opportunity to to put that on the record um, and, and as I give you the reassurance that if you write to the committee with issues and concerns there, then we will maintain a, 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 an ongoing interest in that matter. Yes, please. Just to back up what Chris has said, one of our concerns is that with self-directed support, there's a number of companies that are being set up that are going to charge people directly for advocacy support. So that we're moving away, they're trying to encourage moving away from local authorities and health boards funding advocacy directly. What they want to do is charge individuals for advocacy support and that charge would be a percentage of their social care package. So therefore perpetuating the inequality and, and difficulties for people who might need complicated support because of their situations, we're really concerned about that. Yep, certainly, we, we, as I say, we welcome it. We're very early into the process, but if these issues are appearing as early as this, then the committee would wish to do all it could to bring it attention to the Scottish Government. Brian, I'll be very, very quick. Yes. Just a, a, a reminder, I suppose, that um, under the new Children and Young People's Bill, um, all ministers are obliged to give due regard to children's rights in any policy or legislation that affects children and young people. So... That is relevant to children and young people whose own health and well-being is affected, but also decisions you make about um, the treatment, the care of their parents has a direct impact on them. And under this, as signatories of the UNCRC, you have to give due regard to the impact on a child's rights. So that affects children, the children of prisoners as well as the children of people who are hospitalised and the children's rights impact assessment that may have to go with that, but just to throw that in there at the end. Sorry. Yes, Dr. Allen. Very briefly, and I, yes. I will write in, in, in about fine. this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you, you saw the reports in the papers about NHS dementia care yes. and how poor it can be. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to write in about the, the kind of psychological 
support and developments that can be inputted into this type of care for, for improvement. Um, the, the relative disparity, there are, there are only 37 psychologists employed in older adult services in, in, in Scotland. There are a workforce of 700. Can I say it's an incredibly popular specialty for psychologists to work in, but there are no jobs for them. And I, be, I, I feel very strongly about care of older adults as I get older, and also about care of people who are dementing. So I, I will write in about that. Welcome that. It's Thanks. something I think that the committee will want to look at anyway, given our past work and, and, and uh, our inquiry into older care. Uh, thank you. Derek, you can have the last just, word. Just very well, just, um, Dr Allen brought up the report yesterday just pointing at the East Ayrshire Community Hospital was held up as an example, an excellent example of how to integrate the building and outside spaces in the care of older adults who have dementia. And I thought since it's on the record, I might as well plug the good work in East Ayrshire Community Hospital. It's an important point that you make, not just for, for your own service, but to recognise that there is much going on that is good in the National Health Service. But certainly that report this week was very, very disappointing indeed. Thank you all for your precious time this morning. Can I suspend at this point and we'll set up for...
agenda today. Um, it should only take a moment, but uh, the annual report has uh, um, got to be agreed. It's uh, in the usual standard format for, for all committees. It's um, a simple record of what the committee uh, has uh, done over the parliamentary year. Um, and, uh, you know, just a statement of fact, actually. So I'm looking for the co committee's agreement to publish the annual report as set out. Are we any comments or do we have general agreement as, uh, as to the publication? Yes, no, that's fine. I think it would be wrong not just to draw attention once more to our work on the access to new medicines. The review that the committee's done for, for myself, everything in there is worthwhile, but I think the work we've done on that in partnership with government and other stakeholders um, has been uh, really, really positive. It's yes. in the annual report, it's just an excuse to, to mention it quite frankly. It up, do you mean just in terms, that, of its, in, in, yeah, in, in yeah, terms of yeah, where it sits yeah, in the report yeah, yeah. and maybe an extra... It might be worth get, get, getting a bit, bit, more, bit more prominence, but to be fair, convener, it really was just to put on the public record. No, that's the work fine. We've done that's on fine. It. Yeah. Are we okay with that? I have the committee's agreement then. Mm. Yes. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now uh, close the meeting and, and we have um, uh, a welcome opportunity to, to um, invite uh, the representatives of the Nursing and Midwifery Council to make.